Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm late again. Well, not by a lot, but you know. I'm I'm <laughs> skipping my uh, breakfast because I I woke up late and Sit I. Sit for me, please. Uh, Yay! <laughs> Thirteen months! Yay! Awesome. Super awesome. Thank you so much for your support, mod. Mm. Now, now, we gotta go bother everyone at Discord. <laughs> We left. We left the book on a cliffhanger the last time, the very first time for Nudibles. I mean, they are all always on a on a cliffhanger, but uh, not. Eh, no, no, I don't feel like eating. I I've been snacking a lot lately, and I really feel like I ate too much last night. I can't do without breakfast for a day. The last time we read when we were orphans, Sarah Hemmings suddenly asked our lead, Christopher Banks, to leave to Macau with her. Basically, elope or something. I mean, not elope. Like, she didn't really say anything that's, like, romantic or anything. It's, like, it's very, like, deadpan and, like, and I'm unsure what kind of tone she was carrying. Like, is she in love with him? That she, like, she said, she just sounded more like she wanted to run away and she wanted someone else to run away with her because she's incapable of being alone, or being solo or being single or something like that. Or she's incapable to execute something without someone by her side. Um. Which which contradicts her herself when before she got married to Sir Cecil, uh, where she's like, mm, it's it's hard to say. Okay, so she's like a pursuer kind of like very strong pursuer character. Uh, like she, what if she wants something, she must have it. You know that that kind of um person, and uh, which is. Okay, it's fine. Um, she did, She wasn't invited to the party where Sir Cecil was, was uh, going to, and somehow her target is Sir Cecil. Probably it's because he's like rich and old, so he'll die fast, and he, she can get all his money. But for the turn of event, uh, they went to 
Shanghai to be all political and stuff. But in turn, Sir Cecil went to gamble all their money away. I mean, all his money away. And now, she doesn't have a rich old husband who's gonna die and leave her a lot of money anymore. So she's like, I mean, this is just my interpretation of Sarah Hemings. Like she, so she's like, oh, I got nothing here for me anymore, and I'm feel stuck here. Let's run away. But how do I run away? Um, I need someone to help me yet again, like the last time. Some but somehow somebody help her to get into the party to meet Sir Cecil. So should Christopher, should Christopher Banks trust her? Like Christopher Banks seems to have some sort of like this romantic feelings towards her, very subdued, very English, <laughs> very 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 English, romantic. <laughs> Which is like dead pan, uh, kind of like, like if she steps into a room, she, she, he'll think he'll he look at her, he look at something, she, he'll think about her. That kind of like hints that you know, uh, I think it's Christopher Banks, our lead, is kind of like like her. So the question is, will he actually follow her into Macau? Is this Macau? Rendezvous, a legit one, uh, from Sarah Hemings proposed by Sarah Hemings is a legit one, and that she really want to be with him in Macau, or she's once again using him as some kind of a stepping stone to fly away somewhere else. Well, Sarah Hemings break Christopher Banks' heart. My guess is it's about. Eighty-eight percent that she's just using him mm, because she just seems like a leech kind of person, and that uses them, uses other people to bounce themselves off the ground, kind of feeling. Yeah, that's how I feel about Sarah Hemings. So we left like a cliff cliffhanger where Christopher said that he will join her tomorrow. <laughs> Hello, good morning, Ando. Uh, on high side, I think I may need a an eye drop. Be right back. <laughs> Sometimes my eyes wander. Morning. Sometimes my eyes wander and I like skip a row of sentence, which is very annoying. That's better. Okay. All right. So, as have as we have discussed, uh, my party finder is up. And uh, I'm going to start reading now. Is the l okay? Check check one two three. Check check one two three. Is the microphone volume good enough? Loud enough? Clear enough? Is there any weird static noises or anything? Please let me know. Otherwise, we shall start now. After I get my sip of coffee. I bought this coffee from Singapore and it's really not good the way the flavor profile this the acidity is way too high compared to the sweetness I try to dial I try to make my uh, grinder make it finer 
but it's a uh, but it's a uh, it's still very acidity high on the high <clears throat> okay maybe let me check my uh Sound because sometimes I don't understand why, but sometimes, just so you know, they will change my. Uh, it's about it's the same. It's the same. Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, well, anyway, uh, time to start reading. Yeah, make your own brew. Make your own brew. It's really good. Uh, go go YouTube and find James Hoffman, and you get you will get into a rabbit hole of coffee making that you never wish you you do uh it depends on whether you want to do filter press co uh um, hot press one like uh like the french press or espresso and i will never get into espresso because it's too expensive to me my coffee is always filter but disappointed with the beans that i bought from from singapore very very acid the acidity is really on beyond the high and it, this is a person who likes acidity more acidity in in like like acidity and sweetness in her coffee and the clearness i don't know they're just not the best and they were really expensive like 22 bucks um i mean not expensive in Ah, oh, absolutely zero serial notes. James Hoffman will be very, very disappointed. <laughs> Alright, guys. Look at me, all geeky and shit. Okay. That's not like one of the best hairstyle that my character worn that I never worn before and it looks so good on her I was like, thinking it would look terrible because she has such a long neck you know what shut the fuck up Ariana seriously just start reading man jeez it's taking fucking 10-15 minutes just to start the reading session uh okay guys good morning today we are finishing up when we were orphaned by Kazuo Ishiguro Chapter Wait, what part is this? There's like a million part Part 6 Part 6 Cathay Hotel Shanghai Cathay Hotel Shanghai October 1970 Sorry, part 6, Cathay Hotel, Shanghai, October 1937, chapter 17 of When We Were Orphaned by Kazuo Ishiguro. <sighs> okay, let's go. I went to bed that night, somewhat preoccupied, but awoke the, ne the next morning to find a kind of tranquility had come over me. It was as though a heavy burden had been removed, and when, as I dressed, I thought again of my new situation, I realized I was rather excited. Much of the morning has now been become a haze to me. What I recall is that I become 
I became seized by the idea that I should complete, in time remaining of me, as many possible of the tasks I, I had planned for the next few days. That to, that to do otherwise would be less than consensuous. The obvious lo illogic of this, of, this, of this position somehow failed to trouble me, and after breakfast, I sat to my work with much urgency, urgency, urgency rushing up and down staircases and urging my drivers on, on through the crowded city streets. And although today, it seems a little sense to it seems to make a little sense to me. I have to say, I took considerable pride in being able to sit down to lunch little after two o'clock, having more or less fulfilled all I had set out to do. And yet, at the same time, when I look back on that day, I have the, I have the overwhelming impression I I remained peculiarly detached from my activities. As I hurried around the international settlement, talking with many of the city's most prominent citizens, there, are, there was a part of me virtually laughing at the earnest way they tried to answer my questions, at the pathetic way they tried to help of, of they, to, they tried to be of help. For the truth is, the longer I had been in Shanghai, the more I had come to despise the so-called leaders of this community. Almost every day of my investiga investigations had revealed yet another piece of negligence, corruption, or worse, on their part down the years. And yet in all of the days since my arrival, I had not come across one instance of honest shame, a single acknowledgement that there were not for the prevarica prevarications, the short-sightedness, often downright dishonesty, of those left in charge. The situation would never have reached its present, le present level of crisis. At one, mo at one point that morning, I found myself at the Shanghai club, meeting with three eminent members of the elite, and faced anew with their hollow pomposity they continued denial of their own culpability in their in the whole sorry affair. I felt an ex exhilaration of the prospect of reading my life of such people once and for all. Indeed, at such moments, I felt an utter certainty that I had come to the right decision, that the assumption shared by virtually everyone here, that it was somehow my sole responsibility to resolve the crisis, was not only unfounded, but worthy of the highest contempt. I pictured the astonishment that would soon appear on the same faces at the, at the news of my departure, the outrage and panic that would rapidly follow, and I will admit such thoughts brought me much satisfaction. Then, as I continued my lunch, I found myself thinking of my last meeting with Jennifer that sunny afternoon at her school. Of the two of us, in the prefect's room, sitting awkwardly in our armchairs, the sun playing in the, on the oak paneling, the grass leading down the lake visible in the windows behind her. She had listened in silence as I had explained. To the best of my ability, the necessity of my going away, the overwhelming importance of the task awaiting me in Shanghai, I had paused at several moments, expecting her to ask question or at least to make some comment, but each time she had given a serious nod and waited for me to, to continue. In the end, when I realized I had started to repeat myself, I had come to a halt and said to her, So Jenny, what do you have to say? I do not know what I had expected, but after gazing at me for another moment with a look devoid of any anger, she had replied, Uncle Christopher, I realize I'm not, a very, I'm not very good at anything, but that's because I'm rather still young. Sorry, can I start over that sentence? Uncle Christopher, I realize I'm not very good at anything. But that's because I'm rather young still. Once I'm older, it might not be so long now. 
I'll be able to help you. I'll be able to help you. I promise you I will. So, while you're away, would you please remember? Remember that I'm here in England and that I'll help you when I when you had come when you come back. It was not quite what I had expected. And though often since arriving here, I have thought over the, those words of hers. I am still not sure what she meant to convey to me that day. Was she implying that for all I had just been saying to her, I was unlikely to succeed in my mission in Shanghai? That I would have to return to England and continue my work for, me, for yet many more years? Just as likely, these were simply the words of a confused child, trying hard not to display her upset. And it is pointless to subject them to any sort of scrutiny. For all that, I found myself yet again pondering our last meeting, and as I sat over at my lunch table that afternoon in the hotel conservatory. It was while I was finishing my coffee that the concierge came to tell me that I was wanted urgently on the telephone. I was directed to the phone booth. On the boot on the landing just outside, and after a little confusion with the operator, heard a voice which was vaguely familiar to me. Mister Banks, Mister Banks, Mister Banks. At last, I have remembered. I remained silent, fe- fearing if I said anything at all, I would jeopardize our plans. But then the voice said, Mister Banks, can you hear me? I have remembered something important about the house we we could not search. I realized it was Inspector Cone. His voice, though croaky, sounded startlingly ju- rejuvenated. Inspector, excuse me, you took me by surprise. Please tell me what you remembered. Mr. Banks, sometimes, you know, when I indulge in a pipe, it helps me remember many things I have long forgotten drift before my eyes so I thought very well one last time I shall go back to the pipe and I remembered something that suspect told us the house we could not search it is directly opposite the house of a man called Ye Chen Ye Chen Ye Chen who is that sorry I do not know many of the poorer people They do not use street addresses. They talk of landmarks. The house we could not search. It is opposite Ye Chen's house. Ye Chen, are you sure that was the name? Yes, I'm sure. It came back very clearly. Is it common? Is it a common name? How many people in Shanghai are likely to have that name? Unfortunately, there is another. F- there is one further detail the suspect gave us. This Ye Chen is a blind man. The house you seek is opposite the that of Ye Chen, the blind man. Of course, he may not move the house or pass away. But if you could discover where this man lived at the time of our investigation, of course, Inspector. Why? This is immensely useful. I am glad. I thought you would find it so, Inspector. I cannot thank you enough. One second, please, for coffee. <coughs> Bothering my throat. <coughs> I had become aware of the time when I put down the phone. I did not return to my lunch, but went straight upstairs to pack my. I'm set. I'm went straight upstairs to my room to pack. I recall a strange sense of unreality coming over me as I contemplated which item to take away. At one stage, I sat down on the bed and stared out at the sky visible through my window. It struck me as most curious how only a day earlier the piece of information I had just received would have constituted something utterly central to my life. But here I was turning it over casually in, in my head, and already it felt like something consigned to a past era, something I need not to remember if I did not wish to, if I did not wish to. I must have completed my packing with some time to spare, for when a knock came on my door at half past three precisely, I had been sitting in my chair waiting for a good time. Well, 
for waiting for a good while. I opened the door to a young Chinese man, perhaps not even twenty, dressed in a gown, hat in his hand. I am your driver, sir, he announced softly. If you have suitcase, I will carry. One second, please. As the young man steered the motor car away from the Cathay Hotel, I stared out at the busy crowds of Nanking Road in the afternoon sunshine. I felt I was watching them from a vast distance. I then settled myself in my seat, content to leave everything in the hands of my driver who, despite his youth, appeared assured and competent. I was tempted to ask what his connection with Sa was with with Sarah but then remembered her caution about speaking at, about speaking any more than necessary. I thus remained silent and soon found myself thoughts to returning to Macau and a few and some photographs I have seen of the place many years ago in the British Museum. Then, after we had been travelling for perhaps ten minutes, I suddenly leaned forward to, uh, to the young man and said, I say, excuse me, there is something of a long shot, but do you happen to know of someone called Ye Chen? The young man did not take his gaze from the traffic before him, and I was about to repeat my question when he said, Ye Chen? Blind actor? Yes, well, I know he's blind, though I didn't know he was an actor. Not famous actor Ye Chen. He was act actor once, many, many years ago, when I was a boy. Do you mean you know him? Don't know him? But I know who he is. You interested in Ye Chen, sir? No, no. Not especially. Someone just mentioned to me, mentioned him to me. It really doesn't matter. I did not say anything besides as el anything else to the young man. For the remainder of our journey, we traveled down the baffling series of alleys and I had lost any sense of where we were by the time he pulled up in a quiet st back street. The young man opened the door and gave me my suitcase. That shop, he point, He said pointing, with phonograph. Across the street was the small shop with grimy window, within which indeed a phonograph was displayed. I could see too a sign in English. Gramophone records, piano rolls, manuscripts. Glancing up and down the street, I saw that pa I saw that apart from two rickshaw men squatting beside their vehicles and exchanging banter, the young man and I were alone. I picked up the suitcase and, uh, and was about to cross the, the street when something made me say to him, I wonder, could you wait here a little? The young man looked puzzled. Lady Meadows says only to bring you here. Yes, yes, but I'm asking you now. I would like you to wait just a little longer, just in case I need your services further. Of course, I may not need you, but you know, just in case. Look here. I reached to, into my po pocket and took out some bills. Look, I'll make it worth your while. Yet the young man's face flushed with anger, and he spun away from the money as though I, had, I was proffering something quite repulsive. He suddenly go back into his car and slammed the door. I saw I had made a miscalculation of some sort, but at that moment I could not be bothered to worry about it. Besides, for all his anger, the young man had not started up the engine. I stuffed my money back into my jacket, picked up the suitcase again and crossed the street. Inside, the shop was very cramped. The afternoon sun was streaming in, but somehow only a few dusty patches were lit by it. To one side was an upright piano with discovered keys and several gramophones records displayed without their sleeves along the music stand. I could see not only dust but obwebs on the records. Elsewhere, there were odd pieces of thick velvet. They appeared to be cut off from the theatre curtains, nailed up to the wall together with photographs of opera singers and dancers. I had perhaps expected Sarah to be standing there, but the only person present was a spindly European with a dark pointed beard sitting behind the counter. Good afternoon, 
he said in a Germanic accent, glancing up from the ledger book spread before him. Then, looking me up and down carefully, he asked, You are English? Yes, I am. Good afternoon. We have some records from England. For example, we have a record of Mimi Johnson singing, I only have eyes for you. Would you appreciate? Something in the cautious way he had spoken suggested that this was part this is the first part of an agreed code. But though I searched my memory for some password or phrase Sarah might have told me, I could remember nothing. In the end I said, I have no photograph of me here in Shanghai. But I'm very fond of Mimi Johnson. In fact, I, re I attended a recital of hers uh, in London a few years ago. Really? Mimi Johnson? Yes. I got the impression that I had puzzled him with the wrong response. So I said, Look here, my name is Banks. Christopher Banks. Banks. Mr. Banks. He said, with, he said my name neutrally. Then he said, if you appreciate Mimi Johnson, I only have eyes for you. I shall play it for you, please. He dug under the counter and took the opportunity to look out of the shop window back into the street. The two rickshaw men were still laughing and talking, and I reassured and I was reassured to see the my young man still in the car. Just as I was wondering if I would, if there had not been some big misunderstanding, the warm, languid sound of jazz orchestra filled the room. Mimi Johnson began to sing, and I remembered how the song had been all the rage in London clubs of a few years ago. After a while, I became aware of this spine, spindly or spindly, spindly, spindly man indicating a spot on the rear wall hung with <coughs> with heavy dark drapes i had not noticed before that there was a doorway there but when i pushed i indeed found myself stepping in through stepping through into an inner room sarah was sitting on a wooden trunk wearing a light coat and hat a cigarette was burning in a holder in the cupboard room cupboard like room was already already thick with her smoke. All around us were piles of gramophone records and sheet music stored in assortment of cardboard boxes and tea chests. There was no window, but I could see a back door at that moment slightly ajar, which led outside. Well, here I am, I said. I brought myself just one suitcase, as you insisted, but I see that you have three yourself. This bag here's just for Ethelbert, my my teddy bear. He's been we he's been with me since well forever, really. Silly, isn't it? N silly? No, not at all. When Cecile and I first came here, I took the mistake of putting Ethelbert in with a lot with a whole lot of other things then when i opened the case his arm had fallen off i found it right uh, in the corner stuck inside a slipper so this time give or take a few shawls she's got a whole he's got a whole bag to himself it is silly no no i understand perfectly ethelbert yes one second put he <clears throat> then she carefully put down a cigarette holder and stood up. Then we were kissing, just like I suppose a couple on the cinema screen. It was almost exactly as I had always imagined it would be, except there was something oddly inelegant about our embrace, and I tried more than once to adjust my posture, but my right foot was hard against a heavy box and I could not quite negotiate the necessary turn without risking my balance. And then she had taken a step back, breathing deeply, all the time looking into my eye, into my face. Is everything ready? I asked her. She did not at first reply, and I thought 
she was a- about to kiss me again, but in the end, she said, she said, she said simply, everything, th- everything is fine. We just have several more minutes to, to wait. Then we'll go out there. She indicated the back door. Walk down to the jetty and s- a sampan will take us out to our streamer two miles down the w- the river. After that, it's Macau. And Cecil? Does he have any idea at all? I didn't see him all day. He set off for one of his li- little places straight after breakfast and I expect he'll still be there. It's a great shame. Really, someone should tell him to pull himself together. Well, it's no longer up to us to do so. No, I suppose not. I let out a sudden laugh. I suppose it's not up to us to do anything other than what we chose. That's right, Christopher. Christopher, is something wrong? No, no, I was just trying to... I just wish... I reached out to her, thinking to initiate another embrace, but she raised a hand and said, Christopher, I think you should sit down. Don't worry, there will be time to do everything, everything, later. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Once in our, once we are in Macau, we can have a good think about our future, a good think about where it would be good for us. And where would be good for Jennifer? We'll spread all our maps all over the bed, look out of our ri- room to out on the s- onto the sea and argue all about it. Oh, I'm sure we will argue. I'm looking forward to even to our arguments. Are you going to sit down? Look, sit here. I say, look, if we have to wait a few minutes, let me just go do something. Do something? Do what exactly? Just, just something. Look, really, I won't be gone for long. Just a few minutes. You see, I just have to ask something, someone something. What? Christopher? Who? I don't think we should talk to anyone at this point. That's not what I mean, exactly. I fully realize the need for the caution and so on. No, no, don't worry. It's just that young man, the one you... The one who sent, the one who drove me here, I just need to ask him something. But surely he's gone. No, he's not. He's still out there. Look, I'll be straight back. I hurried out through the curtain back into the shop where this spindly man with a beard looking looked up at me in surprise. You appreciated Mimi Johnson? He asked. Yes, yes. Wonderful. I have just to pop out for a second. Well, I make it clear, sir, that I am Swiss. There is no impending hostility between your country and mine. Ah, yes. Splendid. I'll be back in a moment. I I hurried across the road towards the car. The young man who had seen me rolled down his window and smiled politely. There was there seemed to no to have there seemed to no trace to his earlier temper. Stooping down to him, I said quietly, "Look here." This Yechen, do you have any, sorry, do you have any idea where I might find him? Yechen? He lives very near here. Yechen? Yes, I'm talking about the blind Yechen. Yeah, just over there. His house is, o- his house is over there? Yes, sir. Look here, you don't seem to understand. Are you saying Yechen, the blind Yechen, that this house is just over there? Yes, sir. You may walk over there, but if you wish, a take in car. Listen to me. This is very important. Do you know how long Yechen has lived in, in, the, in his present home? The young man thought, and then he said, He always lived there, sir, when I was a boy. He lived there. Are you sure? Now, look, this is most important. Are you sure this is the blind Yechen and that he's been living there for a long time? I told you, sir. He be there. He's been there since I was a young boy. My guess, I've my guess that he lived there many many years. I straightened, took a deep breath, and thought about the full implication of what I had just heard. Then I leaned down again and said, "I think you should take me there in the car. I mean, we have to approach this carefully. I would like you to take me where, take me there, but to stop the car a little far away, perhaps 
somewhere we we can clearly see the house opposite Yechen's house. Do you understand? I got into the car, and the young man started the engine. He turned the vehicle in the full circle, and we took another narrow street. As we did so, many thoughts crowded into my mind at once. I wonder if I should tell the young man. The significance of the journey we were making, and even considered asking if he was carrying a mini gun in the car. Though in the end, I decided such an inquiry might only panic him. We turned to a corner, into an alley even narrower than the one before. Then we turned again and came into a halt. I thought for a second we had reached our destination, but then realized what had made us stop. The alleyway before us was a crowd of young boys trying to control a bewildered water buffalo. There was some sort of altercation going on between the boys, and as I watched, one of them gave the buffalo a clout on the nose with his stick. I felt a wave of alarm, remembering my mother's warnings throughout my childhood that these animals were as dangerous as a, as any bull when riled. The creature did nothing. However, the boys continued to argue. The young man sounded the horn several times to no avail, and finally, with a sigh, he began to reverse the vehicle back to the way we had come. We took another alley nearby, but this diversion appeared to confuse my driver. For after a few more turns, he stopped and reversed. Though this time there was no obstruction. At one point, we came out to a broader road, rutted mud, mud track. With dilapidated wooden shacks all along one side, please hurry," I said. "I have very little time." Just then, a huge crashing sound shook the ground we were traveling. The young man continued to drive steadily, but looked nervously into the distance. "Fighting," he said. "The fighting starts started again." It sounded awfully close," I said. For the next few minutes, we steered around more narrow corners and little wooden houses. Blasting the horn to scare the children and dogs, then the car came to another abrupt halt, and I heard the young man let out an exas exasperated sound. Looking past him, I saw the way ahead was blocked by a barricade and a set of sandbags and barbed wire. We must go the all the way around, he said. No other way. But look, we must be very close now. Very close, yes. But road block, so we must go all the way around. Be patient, sir. We get there soon, but a distinct change had entered the young man's manner. His earlier assurance has faded. Now he struck me as a ridiculously as ridiculously young to be driving a car, perhaps no more than fifteen or sixteen. For some time we travelled through the muddy, stinking road, down more alleys where I thought we would at any moment plunge into the open gutters, but somehow. The young man always managed to keep our wheels just clear of the edges. All the while, we could hear the sound of gunfire in the distance and see people hurrying back into the safety of their houses and shelters. But there were still the children and dogs, seemingly belonging to no one, running everywhere before us, oblivious to any sense of danger. At one point, as we bumped our way across the yard of some small factory, I said, "Now look, why don't you just stop and and ask the way?" Be patient, sir. Be patient, but you have no more idea where we are going than I have. We、we'll、get there soon, sir. What nonsense! Why do you persist in this charade? It's typical of you Chinese. You're lost, but but you won't admit it. We are we have been driving now for well, it seems like an eternity. Man, as a Chinese myself, I feel attacked. He said nothing. I brought us out onto a mud road and climbed steeply between large heaps of factory refuse. Then came another thunderous crash somewhere alarming near, and the young man dropped his speed to crawl. Sir, I think we go back now. Go back? Go back where? Fighting very near. Not very safe here. What do you mean the fighting's near? Then an idea dawned on me. Are we anywhere near Chape? Sir, we are in Chape. We are in Chape some time. What? You mean we have left the settlement? We in Chape now. But, good God, we are actually outside the settlement in Chape. Look here, you fool. You know what? A fool. 
You told me the house was near. Now we are lost. We are possibly dangerously close to, to the war zone, and we have left the settlement. You are what I call a proper fool. Do you know why? I'll tell you. You pretend to know far more than you do. You are too proud to admit to your shortcomings. That's my definition of a fool exactly. A right fool. Do you hear me? A right and proper fool. He stopped the car, then he opened the door without glancing back and walked off. It took me a moment to calm myself down and assess the situation. We were most of of the of the way up a hill and the car was now in an isolated spot of mud track surrounded by mounds of broken masonry, twisted wire and what looked like the mangled remains of a, an old bicycle wheel. I could see the young man's figure marching up a footpath over the rim of the hill. I got out and ran after him. He must have heard me coming but he neither quickened his pace or looked back. I caught up and stopped him by grasping his shoulder. Look. I'm sorry, I said, panting a little. I apologize. I shouldn't have lost my temper. I apologize. I really do. No excuse for it. But you see, you have no idea what all this means. Now please, I indicated to the car. Let's continue. The young man would not look at me. No more driving, he said. But look, I've said I'm sorry. Now please be reasonable. No more driving. Too dangerous here. Fighting very near. But listen, it's very important I get to this house. Very important indeed. Now tell me truthfully, please. Are you lost or do you know where the house is? I know. I know house. But too dangerous now. Fighting very near. As though to support his point, a machine gun fire suddenly echoed around us. It felt reasonably distant, but it was impossible to tell which direction it was coming from. And we both look about us, suddenly feeling exposed on the hill. I'll tell you what, I said. I took from my pocket my, p my notebook and pencil. I can see you want no further part in all of this. And I can stand... And I can understand your viewpoint. And I'm sorry again. And I was rude to you earlier. But I would like you t to do two more things before you go h home. First, I would like you to please write down here the address of Yechen's house. Yechen's house. No address, sir. There's no address. Very well. Then draw a map. Write down in directions. Whatever. Please do it for me. And then after that, I would like you to drive me to the nearest police station. Of course. That's what I should have done from the start. I'll need train our men. Please. I gave him the notebook and a pencil. Several pages were covered with notes from my inquiries earlier in the day. He turned the tiny pages until he came to a blank one. Then he said, No English. Cannot write English, sir. Then write whatever you can. Draw a map. Whatever. Please hurry. He appealed to now grasp the importance of what I was asking him to do. He thought, Carefully for a few seconds, then began write rapidly. He filled one page, then another. After four or five pages, he slotted the, the pencil back into the spine of the book and, and handed it to me. I glanced through what he had done, but could make no sense of the Chinese script. Nevertheless, I said, Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now please, take me to the police station, then you can go home. Police station this way, sir. He took several further steps in the direction he had been walking. Then, from, from the crest of the hill, he pointed down to the bottom of the slope where, perhaps 200 yards away, a mass of grey buildings begin. Police station there, sir. There? Which building? There, with flag. I see. Yes. You sure that's the police station? Sure, p sir. Police station. From where we were standing, it certainly looked like a police station. I could see, moreover, that there was a little point in trying to drive it. The tr drive to it. The car had been left on the other side of the hill, and the track we had just come up was not wide enough for the vehicle. I could see we might easily get lost again trying to find the way around the hill. I put the notebook in back into my pocket and thought about presenting him with some bank, note, bank notes before, I remem before remembering how offended he had been earlier. I therefore said simply, Thank you, you have been a, 
we have been great of help. I'll manage by myself from here. The young man gave me a quick nod of the head. He seemed to still be angry at me, then turning, went back down to the slope into the direction of the car. That was chapter 17. One moment, please. Chapter 18 Sorry, chapter 18. The police station looked to be abandoned. As I come down to the slope, I could see broken windows and one of the entrance doors hanging off its hinges. But when I picked my way through the broken glass and went inside into the station's reception area, I was met by three Chinese men, two of whom pointed rifles at me, while the third brandished a garden spade. One of them, who was wearing a Chinese army uniform, asked, in halting English, what I wanted. One second. Good morning, Jin. Glad that you made it here. Um, sorry, I'm currently like being. I'm out. I'm on chapter eighteen, but I'm being. An...
Sorry. <laughs> I sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I have to have some work thing to reply. I'll be. I, I can continue now. Sorry. Okay. Eventually, okay. when I managed to convey who I was and that I wish to speak with whomever was in charge, the men began to argue among themselves. Eventually, the one holding the spade disappeared through through into a back room, and the others kept their guns on me while I, while we waited for his return. I took the opportunity to glance about me and concluded that it was unlikely there were any policemen left in the station. Although a few posters and notices remained up, the place looked to have been abandoned some time ago. Cables were dangling off one wall and back, and the back section of the room had been gutted by fire. And after perhaps five minutes, the man with the spade came back a few more exchanges followed in what I guess was Shanghai dialect before finally the soldier gestured that I sh should go with the man with the spade. I followed the, the latter with the <clears throat> I followed the latter through into the back room, which turned out to be also guarded by armed men. But this stood aside for us as as soon as I was going down some rickety stairs into the cellars of the police station. My recollection is a little hazy now as to how we got down to the bunker. There was perhaps a few more rooms. I remember we were walking along a kind of tunnel, stooping to avoid low beams. Here, two were sentries, and each time we encountered one of their looming black shapes, I was obliged to press myself right through the rough wall in order to squeeze past. Eventually, I was shown inside a windowless room that had been turned into some sort of makeshift military headquarters. It was lit by two bulbs dangling side by side from a central beam. The walls were of exposed brick and in the wall to my right there was the gouge, gouge, gouge out hole large enough for a man to climb through. There was a battered wireless set mounted in the opposite corner while in the middle of the floor sat a big office desk which i could see at a glance had been sawn <laughs> had been sawn in, in half then crudely put back together again with the rope with rope and nails Sever several upturned wooden boxes constituted the available seating but the only actual chair being occupied by the unconscious man who was tied up to it he was in a Japanese marine uniform and one side of his face was a mass of bruising. The only other people present were two Chinese army officers, 
both on their feet, bent over some chart spread across the desk. They looked up as I entered, and then one of them came forward and offered his hand. I'm Lieutenant Chow. This is Captain Ma. We are both very honored to have you visit us like this, Mr. Banks. Have you come to lend us your moral support? Well, in actual fact, Lieutenant, I came here with a specific request. Do you say Lieutenant or Lieutenant? I think it's Lieutenant, right? However, I should have hoped that once my task is complete, morale will be boosted to no end. Yours and everyone else's, but I'll need a little assistance, and this is why I have come to you. The lieutenant said something to the captain, to the captain who evidently did not understand English. Then they both looked at me. Suddenly, the unconscious Japanese man in the chair vomited down in front of his uniform. We all turned to stare at him, and then the lieutenant said, You said you need assistance, Mr. Banks. In what form, exactly? I have some directions here. Direction to a particular house. It's imperative I reach this house without any further delay. The directions were written in Chinese, which I am unable to read. But you see, if I even if I could read them, I would need a guide, someone familiar with this locality. So you wish for a guide? Not only that, Lieutenant, I will need four or five good men. More, if possible, they will need to be trained and experienced, since this will be a delicate task. The Lieutenant gave a little, a little laugh, then making, making, his just, making his features solemn once more said, Sir, we are at this moment very short, short of such men. This base is crucial. It's a crucial part to our defense force, and yet you saw for yourself how thinly it is guarded. In fact, the men you saw on the way here are either wounded or sustained fighting we have pushed to the front. I appreciate, Lieutenant, that you are in a demanding situation, but you have to understand. I'm not talking about some casual inquiry I wish to make. When I say I... When I say it's imperative I reach this house, well, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, I'll tell you. There, there's no need to keep it a secret. You and Captain Ma here can be the first to know. The house I wish to find, which I know is very near to us, is none other than the one in which my parents are being held. In none, it's none other, other than the house than the one in which my parents are being... So, oh my god, my brain just like went straight a few sentences. <sighs> the house I wish to find, which I know is very near us, is none other than the one which my parents are being held. That's right, Lieutenant. I'm talking about nothing less then the solving of this case after all these years, you see now why I felt my request even at this busy moment for you, very warranted. The lieutenant's face remained fixed on mine. The captain asked him something in Mandarin, but the lieutenant did not reply. Then he said to me, We are waiting for some men to return from a mission. Seven went out. We do not know if they will all return. It was my intention that they be sent to another location immediately. But now, in this instance, I shall take personal responsibility. These men, however, many of them may return, will accompany you on your mission. I sigh impatiently. Thank you, Lieutenant. But how long will we have to wait for these men? Isn't it possible for me to take a few of the men standing out there? Just several minutes. After all, the house is somewhere. <clears throat> is somewhere very near here, and you see, I have someone waiting. I suddenly remembered Sarah, and a kind of panic seized me. I took another step forward and said, "In fact, Lieutenant, I wonder if I may use your telephone. I really should speak to her." I'm afraid there's no telephone here, Mr. Banks. There is a radio connected only with our headquarters and other help, other bases. Well then, it's, if, it's all the more imperative I clear this matter without delay. You see, 
sir, there's a lady waiting. <coughs> Sorry. Even as we speak, may I suggest I take three or four of the men out there guarding the ha this ha this base? My God, my reading today. Jesus Christ. Mr. Banks, please calm yourself. We will do all we can to assist you, but as I have said already, the men outside are not fit for such mission. They will only jeopardize it. I understand you have to wait many years to solve this case, but I would consult, cons, con, counsel you. My God! I would counsel you not to act hastily in this juncture. There was a good sense in the lieutenant's voice, uh, lieutenant words. With a sigh, I sat down on one of the upturned tea chests. Then, the man should not be much longer now, said the lieutenant. Mr. Banks, may I see these directions that you have? I was reluctant to let go of my notebook, even for a few seconds. But in the end, I handed it to her, uh, sorry, to the, to the officer, open at the appropriate pages. He studied the directions for a while, then returned the, the notebook to me. Mr. Banks, I should tell you, this house, it will not be so easy to reach. But I happen to know, sir, it's very near here. It's very near, that is true. Nevertheless, it will not be easy. Indeed, Mr. Banks, it may even be behind Japanese lines by now. Japanese lines? Well, I suppose I could always reason with the Japanese. I have no quarrel with them myself. Sir, if you come with me, I will show you, while we wait for the man, the exact, our exact position. For a moment, he spoke rapidly to the captain. Then he walked towards a broom cupboard in the corner, flung open its door, and stepped inside. It took me a moment to realize I was expected to, ex expected to follow, but then, when I tried to en also to enter the cupboard, I almost walked into the heels of the lieutenant's boots, which were now all directly in front of my face. I heard his voice say from, from the darkness above, If you please follow me, Mr. Banks, there are 48 rungs. It is better you keep at least 5 rungs below me. He, his feet disappeared. Stepping further into the cupboard, I reached out my hands and found some metal rungs on the brick before me, far above the Far above in the darkness, I could see a little pond of sky. I guessed that we were at the bottom of a chimney an obs or an observation tower used by the police. For the first few rungs, I found myself going awkward. Not only was I nervous of missing my grip in the dark, there was also the worry of the lieutenant slipping and falling down on me. But eventually, the patch of sky grew larger, and then I saw the lieutenant figure clambering about out above me. In another minute and or so, I had joined him. We were standing up on the high flat roof, surrounded on all sides of by miles of densely packed rooftops. Away in the distance, perhaps a, ma a half mile to the east, I could see a column of dark smoke rising into the late afternoon sky. It's odd, I said, looking around me. How do people get about down there? There appear to be no streets. That is exactly, that is certainly how it looks from up, from up here, but perhaps you will care to look through this. He was holding out a pair of binoculars. I raised them to my eyes and spent some time adjusting them until I could see clearly, only to find I was gazing out at a chimney stack a few yards in front of me. Eventually, though, I managed to focus on the column of smoke in the distance. The lieutenant's voice said somewhere close beside me. You are now looking at the warren, Mr. Banks. The factory workers live there. I am sure all, in all time you were a child here, you never visited those the warren. The warren? No, I don't think so. Almost certainly not. Foreigners rarely see such places unless they are missionaries or perhaps communists. I am Chinese, but I too, like many of my peers, was never permitted to go near such places. I knew nothing about the war until 30, 1932, the last time we fought the Japanese. 
You would not believe human beings could live like that. It's like an ant's nest. Those houses, they were intended for the, for the poorest people. Houses with tiny rooms, row after row, back to back. A warren, if you look carefully, you may see the lanes. Little alleys, just wide enough to allow the people to get into their homes. At the back, the houses have no windows at all. The rare rooms are black holes, backing onto the houses behind. Forgive me, I am telling you this for good reason, as you will see. The rooms were all small because they were for the poor. There was a time when there were seven or eight people shared such a room. Then, as the years went on, families were forced to make partitions even within these small rooms to share rent with another family. And if they still couldn't pay their landlords, they would partition the room further. I remember seeing tiny black clos closets. Thank you for being here, Kiru. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and this here. I remember seeing tiny black closets divided four times, each with the family in it. Do you not believe this, Mr. Banks, that human beings can live like this? It does seem unbelievable, but if you have seen these conditions yourself, Lieutenant, when the fight against the Japanese is over, Mr. Banks, I will consider giving my services to the communists. You think that is a dangerous thing to say? There are many officers who would rather fight under the communists than under Chiang. I moved the binoculars over to the dense mass of shabby roofs. I could see now that many of them were broken through. I could decipher, moreover, the lanes of the, of the lieutenant that had mentioned narrow passageways threading here and there into the tenements. But this is no shanty town, the lieutenant's voice was, con was continuing. Even if the partitions erected by the tenants are flimsy, the essential structure, the warren itself, is brick. They prove crucial in 19... Wait, sorry. They prove crucial. Hmm? Eh? My God. One second, please. I'm sorry. They proved crucial in 1932 when the Japanese attacked. And it is proving so to us now. I can see that. I said, a solid warren defended by soldiers. No easy prospect for the Japanese even with their modern weapons. You're right. The Japanese weaponry, even in training, in their training, counts for almost nothing down be down down there, sorry. Fighting is reduced to rifles, bayonets, knives pistols, spades, meat cleavers, and the Japanese line in the past weeks has actually been pushed back. The point, you see that smoke, Mr. Banks? That point was held by the enemy only last week, but now we have pushed them, we have pushed them back. Are the civilians still living down there? There are indeed. You may not believe it, but even close to the front, some of the houses are worn in the warren are still occupied. This makes it even harder for the Japanese. They cannot, they cannot shell indiscriminately. They know the Western power are watching and they fear. Ruthlessness will have a cost. How long can your troops hold out? Who knows? Chiang Kai-shek may send us reinforcements or the Japanese might decide to give up and redeploy, concentrate instead of instead on Nanking or Chungking. It is by no means certain we will not be victorious, but the fighting recently had caused us clearly. If you move your field glasses to the left, Mr. Banks, now do you see that road? Yes, that road is locally known as Pig's Alley. Sorry, Pig's Alley. It doesn't look impressive, like it doesn't look an impressive road, but now it is very important to the outcome. As you see, 
There is one road that runs along the edge of the warren. At the moment, our troops have sealed it off and ma have managed to keep the Japanese out. If they are able to come down that road and the warren ha can be penetrated all along the sides, there will be no point in our attempting to hold out. We will have to be flanked. You ask for men to accompany you to the house where your parents are. The men who will accompany you would otherwise have been deployed, defending the barricade of the pig's alley. The last few days, fighting has been, the fighting there has been desperate. Meanwhile, of course, we are having also to hold out our line across the warren. From up here, you, would, you wouldn't think there was much going on down there. Indeed, I can assure you, inside the warren, things are very bad. Things now are very bad. I tell you this, Mr. Banks, since you are intending to go in there. For a moment or two, I went on gazing through the glasses in silence. Then I said, Lieutenant, the Lieutenant, that house, the house where my parents are being held, will I be able to see it up from here? His hands touched my shoulders briefly, though I did not take my eyes from the binoculars. Do you see, Mr. Banks, the remains of the tower standing to the left? It looked like one of those Easter Island figures. Yes, yes, that's it. If you draw a line from there over to the remains of the large building to the right, the old textile warehouse that was this morning, the line to which our men had been had beaten back to J beaten back the Japanese. The house where your parents are being held is roughly level with the tall chimney on your left. If you draw a line, a very level very level with it across the warren until you come to adjust a little left of where we are now standing. Yes, yes. You mean near the roof? The one with the eve pointing up into the into an arc? Yes, that's it. Of course, I cannot say with certainty, but according to those directions you so you showed me, that is roughly where the house is. I stared through the field glasses at the particular roof. For some time, I could not stop staring, even though I was conscious of keeping the lieutenant from his duty. After a while, it was the lieutenant who said, It must feel strange to think you might be looking at the very house containing your parents. Yes, Yes, it does feel a little strange. Of course, it might not be that house. That was simply a guess on my part. But it will be somewhere near it, very near it. That tall chimney I showed you, Mr. Banks, the locals refer it to as the East Furnace. The chimney you can see much closer to us, almost directly in line with the other, belongs to the West Furnace. Before the fighting, the inhabitants used to burn their refuse at one and or another of, th of these places. I would advise you, sir, to use the furnaces as, as your landmarks as you are within the warren. Otherwise, it is hard for a stranger to keep his bearings. Look again carefully at the far chimney, sir. Remember, the house you seek is only a little way, a, li a little away, little way away from it, in the direct lines due south. I finally lowered the binoculars. Lieutenant, you have been the most, you have been most kind. I can't tell you how grateful I am to you. In fact, if it won't embarrass you, you will perhaps permit me to mention you by name during the ceremony that will take place in just. Jasper Parks to commemorate the freeing of my parents. Really, my help has not been so significant. Besides, Mr. Banks, you must not assume that your task is accomplished. Standing up here, it does not look far away, but inside the warren there is still a lot of fighting. Although you are not a combatant, it will still be difficult to move from the house from house to house, and aside from the two furnaces, there are a few clear landmarks surviving. Then, you must bring your parents out safely. In other words, you still have a daunting task ahead of you. But now, Mr. Banks, I suggest that we go back down. The men, who may well be, have returned by now, will be, waiting, will be awaiting my orders. And as for you, Mr. Banks, you must try to come back before nightfall. It is hellish enough moving through the warrant in daylight. 
At night, it will be like drifting through one's worst nightmares. If you are overtaken by darkness, I would advise you to find some safe place and wait with the men until morning. Only yesterday, only yesterday, two of my men killed each other. They were so disoriented in the dark. I've taken to heart everything you have said, Lieutenant. Well then, let's let's be going back down. Downstairs, Captain Ma was talking to a soldier in a badly torn uniform. The latter did not appear to be wounded, but seemed shocked and upset. The Japanese in the chair was now snoring as though enjoying a peaceful nap. Though I noticed he had vomited some more down the front of his clothes. The lieutenant conferred quickly with the captain, then questioned the soldier in the torn uniform. Then he turned to me and said, It is bad news. The others have not returned. Two have certainly been killed. The remainder are trapped, although there's a good chance they will, they will yet escape. The enemy has, if only temporarily, made an advance, and it may well be that house your parents are in is now behind their lines. Regardless of that, lieutenant, Lieutenant, I still need to proceed, and without any further delay, look here. If the men you promised, you promised me haven't returned, then perhaps, though I realize it's a lot to ask, perhaps you'd be good enough to escort me yourself. Honestly, sir, I can't think of a more suitable person to assist me at this point. The lieutenant thought this over with, with grave expression. Very well, Mr. Banks, he said. Finally, I shall do as you t ask, but we must hurry. I should not really leave this post at all. To do so for any length of time could be could ha could have the most awful consequences. He issued rapid instructions to the to the captain, then opening a drawer in the desk, began placing a number of items into the pockets and belt. Is it better for you to not? Is it better you do not do not carry a rifle, Mr. Banks? But do you have a pistol? No? Then take this. It is German and very reliable. You should keep it concealed, and if we encounter an enemy, you must not hesitate to declare your neutrality immediately and clearly. Now, if you will follow me. Taking a rifle that was leaning against the desk, he strode ever he strode over to the hole gouge into the opposite wall and nimbly climbed through. I pushed the pistol into my belt where it was more or less concealed in my jacket then hurried after him. One second for coffee. Chapter 19 When we were often by Kazuo Ishiguro oh. Thank you so much for the follow, Kiru! Thank you so much, thank you so much. I'm sorry, today I'm like very uh, very distracted because I have some like work text messages that I need to reply as AP, otherwise I'll lose my job. No, just kidding. Um, 
but yeah. Sorry I'm distracted, but yes, chapter 19. Chapter 19, when we were orphaned by Kazuo Ishiguro. <sighs> Let me take a deep breath and breathe out. I need to read slower. I need to stop stuttering so much. Lieutenant, Lieutenant. Lieutenant, Lieutenant, I don't know which one is better way to say it. I think it's a French word, right? Lieutenant, I think Lieutenant is wrong. I don't know. I don't think that's wrong or right, but whatever. I'll just call it Lieutenant because that's how I learned in English during school days. Okay, chapter nineteen. When we were orphaned by Kazuo Ishiguro. It is only hindsight that makes the first part of that journey appear relatively easy. At the time, as I stumbled after the lieutenant's striding figure, it certainly did not feel that way. My feet quickly began to smart from the rubble-strewn ground, and I found terribly awkward the contortions required to negotiate the holes in each wall. Of the latter, there seemed an unending number, all of them more or less similar to the tone in the cellar command base. Some were smaller, some large enough for two men to squeeze through at the same time, but they all had been gouged out with rough edges and required a little jump to climb through. Before long, I could. Before long, I found myself close to the to exhaustion. No sooner had I climbed through one hole. One such hole, and I would spot the lieutenant ahead of me, smarting, smartly easing his way through the next wall. Not all the walls were still standing. Sometimes he, w we would pick our way through the debris of what must have been there, three or four houses before encountering another wall. The roofs were all smashed and often absent together. Altogether, so that we had plenty of daylight from the sky, though here and there heavy shadows made it easy to lose one's step. More than once, until I grew more accustomed to the terrain, my foot slipped painfully between two jagged slabs or sank ankle deep into fragmented rubbles. It was all too easy in such circumstances to forget we were passing through what only several weeks before had been the homes of hundreds of people. In fact, I often had the impression we were moving through not a slum district, but some vast ruined mansion with endless rooms. Even so, every now and then, it would occur to me that in the mung of the wreckage beneath our feet lay cherished heirloom, heirloom <clears throat> cherished heirlooms, children's toys, simple but much-loved items of the family life. And I found myself suddenly overcome with renewed anger towards those who had allowed such a fate to befall so many innocent people. I thought again of those pompous men in the international settlement and all the prevarications they must have employed to evade their responsibilities down so many years. And at such moments, I felt my fury, mount, my fury mount with such intensity, I was on the verge of calling out to the lieutenant to halt, just so I could give vent to it. The lieutenant did, though, pause at one point of his own accord and caught up, and as I caught up with him, said, Mr. Banks, please take a good look at this. He was indicating a little over to our left, look towards a large boiler-like construction, which though covered in masonry, masonry dust, had remained more or less intact. This is the West Furnace. If you look up there, you will see the nearer of the two tall chimneys we saw earlier from the roof. The East Furnace is similar in appearance to this, and it will be our next clear landmark. When we reach it, we shall know we are very close to the house. I studied the furnace carefully. A chimney of some girth emerged from above its shoulders, and when I took a few steps closer and looked up, I could see the huge chimney going off up, way up into the sky. I was still staring at it when I heard my companion say, Please, Mr. Banks, we must continue. It is important we complete our task before the sun sets. It was several minutes bef after the west furnace that the lieutenant 
Jack's manner became noticeably more cautious. He threat, his threat became deliberate, and each, and at each hole he would peer through his rifle poised, listening intently before climbing up. I also began to spot where, spot more and more stacks of sandbags or coils of barbed wires left within reach of the holes. When I first heard the machine gun, I abruptly froze, believing we were under fire. But then I saw the lieutenant before me still walking, and with a deep breath, I, w I went, after him, went on after him. Eventually, I came through a hole to find myself in a much larger space. In fact, in my exhausted condition, I thought I had entered the bomb remained of one of those grand ballrooms I had been taken to in the settlement, and then realized we were standing in an area once occupied by several rooms. The partition walls had almost entirely vanished, so that the next good wall was all of 25 yards away. There, I could see an I could see seven or eight soldiers lined up, their faces to the break. I first took I at first took them for soldiers and for prisoners, but then I saw how each man was standing before a small hole through which he had inserted the barrel of his rifle. The loot the lieutenant had already crossed the rubble and was talking to a man crouched behind a machine gun mounted on a tripod. This machine gun arrangement was positioned before the largest hole, the one through which we would have to climb to continue our journey. Coming closer, however, I saw the perimeters of the hole had been decked with barbed wires, allowing only enough space for the gun bar to, the man to maneuver. I suppose at first the lieutenant was asking the men to remove this obstacle out of our way, but then I asked how tense all those present all those present had become the man behind the machine gun all the time the, the lieutenant spoke to him never took his gaze from the hole behind him the soldier too soldiers too all along the wall remained still and poised their attention utterly focused on whatever was on the other side once the alarming implications of this scene had sunk in i felt inclined to climb back through the previous hole, and then I saw the lieutenant returning towards me and remain where I was. We have some trouble, he said. A few hours ago, the Japanese managed to push forward a little. We have now beaten them back again, and the line has been re-established where it was this morning. However, there would seem several Japanese soldiers did not retreat with the others and are now caught behind the line, behind our line. They are completely cut off and thus very dangerous. My men believe they are at this moment on the other side of that wall. Lieutenant, you're not suggesting, are you, that we delay while we, while we, well, that we delay while this matter sorts itself out? I'm afraid we will have to wait, certainly. But for how long? It is hard to predict. These soldiers are trapped and they will be either captured or killed in the end. But meanwhile, they have weapons and are very dangerous. You mean we could wait for hours? Days even? That is possible. It would be very dangerous at this point for the two of us to continue. Lieutenant, I'm surprised at you. I was under the impression that you, an educated man, were fully aware of the urgency of our present undertaking. Surely there's some other route we could take to bypass these soldiers? You know what? Fuck Christopher Banks. He's such a terrible character. He's so full of himself and like like he's such a like I'm the main character. Like <laughs> This is truly this is honestly one of the worst Kazuo Ishiguro books I've read. Who the fuck cares about your missing parents? Who the fuck cares? Who the fuck cares? Like, the fuck cares? People are going through worse shit than like... You're like... Talking like as if you solving your own fucking stupid parents missing crime is more important than fucking... The Japanese occupation in their country. It's like... So insensitive of a fucking white guy. Firstly... And secondly, who the fuck cares about your parents? They're probably dead as fuck. 
This is so infuriating to to read. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm, I'm like like the entire book. Like I'm at page two hundred and forty three, and the entire book I've been trying my best to give it a chance. After that one last line, it's like, bruh, nobody cares about your family. Seriously, go home. Go fuck yourself. Go go to Macau. Fuck that girlfriend of yours. Like seriously. Bruh, please. <laughs> Christopher Banks is the one of the worst fucking characters ever written. So shit. There are other routes, but it rain it remains the case that however we proceed, we will be in considerable danger. Unfortunately, yes, sir, I see no alternative but w but to wait. It is possible the situation will be resolved before long. Excuse me. You know what? Christopher Banks really deserves Sarah Hemmings. The both of them deserve each other. The both of them are users. Like he's so useless. Like he came to Shanghai want to solve the case of his missing parents but he his his connection with people are so fucking bad and then he doesn't even know how to like navigate himself in the city to find his own way and then he get angry at other like angry at the locals for not trying to help him more than they should they're like like the fuck man who fuck cares about you and your fucking parents man go fuck yourself man seriously bitch one of the soldiers by the wall had been signaling urgently and now the, le the lieutenant began to go across the rubble towards him but just then the machine gunner let loose a deafening burst of fire and when he ceased there was an extended scream coming beyond from beyond the wall the scream began full-throated, then tapered off into a strange high-pitched whimper. It was an eerie sound and I became quite transfixed listening to it. It was only when the lieutenant came rushing back and pulled me behind some fallen masonry that I realized there were bullets hitting the wall behind me. Yeah, duck, you bitch. The men at the next wall were now firing too, and then the machine gunner let off another burst. The authority of this weapon seemed to silence all the others, and thereafter, what for what felt like an inordinate time, the only sound to be heard came from the wounded man beyond the wall. His high-pitched whimpers continued for several moments then he began to shout something in japanese over and over every now and then the voice would rise into a fran frantic shriek and then die away again into a whimper whimper the guy behind jean hello rudolph good morning rudolph Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Kiru. Thank you, Kiru, for the follow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jean, Lamau. You guys missed out on me yelling at the book just now. <laughs> the disembodied voice echoed unnervingly around the ruins, but the Chinese soldiers in front of me remained utterly still. The concentration not wavering from what they could see through the wall. Suddenly, the machine gunner turned and vomited on the ground beside him, and before death, before immediately turning back to the wire deck hole in front. From the way he did this, it was not easy to tell if his sickness had to do with nerves, so the sounds of the dying man, or simply some stomach complaint. Then eventually, though their postures hardly changed, the soldiers all perceptibly perceptibly relaxed i heard the, so the i heard the lieutenant say beside me so you see now mr banks that it is no easy matter to proceed from here we have been crouching down on our knees and i noticed my light flannel suit was now all almost entirely covered in dust and grime it took a few seconds to, co to collect my thoughts before saying i appreciate the risk but we must nevertheless continue Particularly with all the fighting going on, my parents shouldn't be left in that house a moment longer than necessary. May I suggest we take this man here with us? 
Then, if these Japanese soldiers set upon us, we'll be much str the stronger. As the commanding officer here, I cannot possibly sanction such an idea, Mr. Banks. If these men leave their position, the headquarters would be, would be entirely vulnerable. Besides, I will be putting the man's life at needless risk. I gave a sigh of exasperation. I must say, Lieutenant, it was pretty sloppy work on the part of your men to have allowed the Japanese in behind your line. If all your people had been doing their jobs properly, I'm sure such a thing would never have arisen. This is the words of a fucking white man who has never tried to defend anything in his life. And then he's just fucking, like, fucking insulting the soldiers non-fucking stop. Holy shit, this reading session is, has turned into a ranting session. Holy shit, every fucking single dialogue that comes out of this Christopher Banks is like... What a fucking bitch! If you're so fucking... Like, if you're so fucking brave and all that shit, go do it yourself, you bitch. Don't ask people's help. What depends? Oh. <laughs> you speak as if, like, he speaks as if he could do everything all these people do. If you're so good at defending yourself, solving cases yourself, go fucking do it yourself. Get the fuck out of here, go to the house, and go find your parents. Hey, you know what makes me even more, like, makes it even more infuriating? is the fact that he spoke as if he is 100% sure that his parents will be in the house. There is no evidence, not a single piece of evidence that his parents are in that house. And he's speaking as if it's 100% and then he's making all these other people, in the, lo the local people to do whatever his whims. I didn't even see you, little Tomberry. Thank you for being here, Ophelia. You're so dark that I didn't even see you. I'm so sorry. Sorry, I'm like fucking venting like hell. This is stupid. This bitch is stupid. Christopher Banks is a bitch. He's like, oh, I gave an exasperated sigh of ex is like fucking. I must say, Lieutenant, it was pretty sloppy work. Like your man's so sloppy that the 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 Japan just got over your lines. Like it's so so useless. If like your people don't even do your jobs properly, <laughs> like fucking bitch, man. Seriously. Okay, let us continue before. <laughs> let us continue before people leave my stream because I complain so much. Okay. Right. So the lieutenant said. My men have fought with commendable bravery, Mr. Banks. It is hardly their fault that your mission is, for the time being, inconvenienced. What do you mean by that, Lieutenant? What are you implying? Oh my god. Please calm yourself, Mr. Banks. I'm merely pointing out. It is not the fault of my men if... Then whose fault is it, sir? I realize what you are implying. Oh yes, I know you have been thinking it for some time now. I was wondering when you had finally come out with it. Sir, I have no idea what. I know full well yet what you are thinking all this time, Lieutenant. I could see it in your eyes. You believe this all my fault. All of this, all of it, all this terrible suffering, this destruction here. I could see it in your face when we are walking through it all just now. But that's because you know nothing. Practically nothing, sir, concerning this matter. You may well know a thing or two about fighting, but let me tell you, it's quite another thing to solve a complicated case of this kind. You obviously haven't the slightest idea what's involved. Such things takes time, sir. A case like this one, it requires great delicacy. I suppose you can imagine you can just rush at it with bayonets and rifles, do you? It's taken time. I accept that. But that's in the very nature of a case like this. But I don't know why I bothered to say all this. What would you understand about it, a simple soldier? Mr. Banks, there's no need for us to quarrel. I 
I have only the most sincere good wishes for your success. I am simply telling you what is possible. I am getting less and less interested in your idea of what is and isn't possible, Lieutenant. If I may say so, you are hardly a good advertisement for the Chinese army. Do I take it you are now going back on your words? That you are unwilling to accompany me beyond this point? I take it so. I am to be left out to carry this difficult task by myself very well. I shall do so. I shall raid the house single-handed. This is the most infuriating text I've ever written in a while. Christopher Banks is a bitch. I think, sir, you should calm yourself before saying anything more. And one more thing, sir. You can safely assume I will no longer be mentioning you by name at the Jessville Park celebration. And at least if I do, it will not be in a complimentary light. Mr. Banks, please listen to me. If you determine to continue despite the danger, then I cannot stop you. But you will undoubtedly be safer alone. With me, you certainly run the risk of being fired upon. You, on the other hand, are a white man in civilian clothes. As long as you are very careful and announce yourself clearly before any encounter, it is possible you will come to no harm. Of course, I repeat my recommendation that you wait until the situation here is resolved. But then again, as someone myself with aging parents, I can well understand your feelings of urgency. I rose to my feet and brushed off as much dust as I could. Well then, I shall be on my way, I said coolly. coldly. In that case, Mr. Banks, please take this with you. He was holding out a small torch. My advice, as before, is to stop and wait. If you do not reach your destination by dark, but I can see from your present attitude, you might well be inclined to push, the push on. In which case, you will certainly need a torch. The batteries are not new, so do not use it any more than you need to. I dropped the torch into my jacket pocket and then thanked him somewhat grudgingly. Already... Rather regretting my outburst. <laughs> I want to slap my head on my table right now. The dying man had now stopped trying to talk and was just screaming again. I had begun to walk towards the sound when the lieutenant said, you can't go that way, Mr. Banks. You will have to move north for a while, then try to navigate yourself back on the course. Come this way. For a few moments, he led me on the path perpendicular to the one we had been taking. In time, we came to another wall with a hole gouged out of it. You should go this way for at least half a mile before turning east again. You may still meet soldiers from either side. Remember what I told you. Keep your revolver hidden and always announce your neutrality. If you encounter any of the inhabitants, ask them to direct you to the East Furnace. I wish you luck, sir, and I regret I cannot assist you any further. After I have been moving north for several minutes, I noticed the houses become less damaged. That it did not, however, make my journey any easier. The roofs being more intact meant I had to make do with much murkier light. I have decided I decided to save my torch till nightfall and I would often have to feel my way along a wall for some distance before coming across an opening. There was some reason far more broken glass in this vicinity and also a large area submerged in stagnant water. I frequently heard the scuttling of, of large groups of rats and once trod on a dead dog but could not, but could not hear any sounds of fighting. It was at first, this at around this stage of, of the journey, that I found myself thinking again 
and again of Jennifer sitting in the prefect's room on the sunny afternoon we had parted, and in particular of her face as she had made that curious vow uttered so earnestly to help me when she was older. Once, as, as I groped my way forward, an absurd picture came into my head of a poor child struggling after me through this ghastly terrain, determined to make good of her promise, and I suddenly felt a rush of emotion that all but brought me brought tears to my eyes. Oh my god, he's a fucking bitch. This this he's not really a fucking bitch. He's like oh my god, this bitch. Then I came upon a hole in my wall through which I could see only pitch blackness but from which came of, came most overwhelming stink of excrement i knew that to keep on course i should climb through into the room but i simply could not bear the idea and kept walking the fastidiousness cost me my dear cost me dear but i did not find another opening for some time and thereafter i had the impression of drifting further and further off my road by the time it grew completely dark, I began to use the, the torch. I was coming across many more signs of inhabitation and would often stumble into a barely damaged chest of drawers or shrine, even the whole even whole rooms in which furnishing were hardly disturbed, giving the impression that family had just gone out for the day. But then, right next to such places, I would discover more rooms utterly destroyed or flooded. There were of two more and more stray dogs, scrawny beasts. I feared my a uh, uh, scrawny beast that I feared might attack me, but which invariably shrank away, growling when I shone my beam at them. Once I came upon three dogs savagely tearing apart something and drew my pistol. So con so convinced was I, they would come for me. But even these animals meekly watched me pass by, as though they had come to respect the carnage of a man was capable of wrecking. I was not surprised then when I came across the first family. I found them in my torch beam, cowering back in, into a dark corner. Several children, three women and, and uh, three women and elderly men around them were the bundles and utensils of their existence. They stared at me in fear, brandishing makeshift weapons which they lowered down only slightly at my words of reassurance. I tried to inquire if I was anywhere near the East Furnace, but they returned with uncomprehending stares. I came across three or four more such families in the nearby houses. Increasingly, I was able to use actual doorways rather, rather than openings in the walls, but found them no more responsive. Then, I entered a, a large space, the far side of which was bathed in the reddish glow of lantern. There were a lot of people standing about in the shadows, again, predominantly women and children with few elderly men among them. I had begun to utter my usual words of reassurance when I sensed something odd in the atmosphere and stopping, reached, reached instead, of, instead for my revolver. One moment, please. For tea. <clears throat> Faces turned to me in the lantern glow, but then, almost immediately, the gazes returned to the far corner where a dozen or so children had crowded around something down on the ground. Some of the children were poking with sticks at whatever it was, and then I noticed that many of the adults were holding at ready sharpened spades, choppers and other improvised weapons. It was as though I had disturbed some dark ritual and my first inclination was to walk past. Perhaps it was because I heard a noise or perhaps it was some some sixth sense and then I found myself revolver still drawn moving towards the circle of children. The latter seemed re reluctant to reveal what they had but gradually their, their shadows parted. I then saw in the dim red glow of the figure of a Japanese soldier lying lying quite still on his bed. His hands were tied behind his back. His feet, too, had been bound. His eyes were closed, and I could see the dark patch soaking through his uniform under the armpit further from the, gown, from the ground. 
His face and hair were, co were covered in dust and speckled with blood. For all that, I recognized Akira with no difficulty. The children had started to gather round again, and one boy, uh, and one boy, boy. <laughs> Oh my god, my reading today is like dog shit. And one boy, oh boy, prodded Akira's body with a stick. I commanded them to get away, waving my revolver, and re eventually the children retreated a little way, all watching carefully. Akira's eyes remained closed when I looked him over. His uniform was torn away at the back, right down to his raw skin, suggesting he had been dragged along the ground. The wound near his armpit was probably caused by a shrapnel. There was a swelling and cut on the back of his head, but he was so covered in grime and the light was so poor, it was hard to ascertain how serious these injuries were. When I shone the torch on him, heavy shadows fell everywhere, making it harder to see clearly. Then, after I had been examining him for a few moments, he opened his eyes. Akira! I said, bringing my face close. It's me, Christopher! It occurred to me that with the light be behind my head, I would appear to him no more than an, an intimidating silhouette. I thus called to his name again, this time turning the torch beam on my face. It is possible this action only served to make me look like some hideous apparition for Akira Grimace, then spat contemptuously at me. He could not summon much force and the saliva dribbled down his cheek. Akira, it's me! How fortunate to, fi to find you like this! Now I can help you! He looked at me and then he said, Let me die. You're not dying, old chap. You've lost some blood and you've had something of a rough time of it lately, but we'll get you to some proper help and you'll be fine. You'll be fine, you see. Pig. Pig. Pig? You pig. Again, he spat at me and again the spittle dribbled out of his mouth without, spore, without force. Akira, clearly you still don't realize who I am. Let me die. Die like soldier. Akira, it's me, Christopher. I do not know, you pig! Listen, let me get these robes off you, then you'll feel much better, then you'll soon come to your senses. I glanced over my shoulder, thinking to demand some tool with, with which to cut his bonds. I then saw all the people in the room gathered in the crowd just like a little way behind me, many holding weapons of one sort of a, or another, as though posing for a sinister group photograph. I was somewhat taken aback. I had for the moment forgotten about them and felt for my revolver. But just at that moment, Akira said with a new energy, If you cut string, I kill you. You warn. Okay? English? What are you talking about? Look, you blockhead. It's me, your friend. I'm going to help you. You pig. Cut string, I kill you. Look, these people here will kill you just as quickly. In any case, your wounds will become infected soon. You have to let me help you. Suddenly, two of the Chinese women began to shout. One appeared to be addressing me, while the other was shouting to the back of the crowd. For a moment, confusion reigned. Then, a boy around ten emerged holding a sickle. As he came into the light, I could see... A piece of fur, perhaps a remain of a rodent dangling from the point of the blade. It struck me the boy was holding the sickle with such care so as not to let it let this offering drop. But then the woman who had shouted at me grabbed the sickle and whatever it, it was fell to the ground. Now look, I stood up and cried to the crowd. You have made a mistake. This is a good man, my friend, friend. The woman shouted again, indicating that I should step aside. But he's not your enemy, I went on. He's a friend. He's going to help me. Help me solve the case. I raised the revolver and the woman stepped back. Meanwhile, everyone was talking at once and the child began to cry. Then, an old man was pushed to the front, a young girl holding his hand. I can speak English, he said. 
Well, thank goodness for that. I said, kindly, tell everyone present that this man here is my friend. That he's going to help me. Him, Japanese soldier. He killed Aunt Yoon. I'm sure he didn't. Not him personally. He killed and steal. But not this man. This is Akira. Did anyone see him? This particular man kill or steal? Go on, ask them. Rather reluctantly, the old man turned and muttered something. This provoked more arguing and another weapon, a sharpened spade, was handed round and grabbed by one of the women, the other women at the front. Well, I asked the old man, aren't I right? No one saw Akira personally doing anything wrong, right? The old man shook his head and perhaps to disagree, perhaps to indicate he had not understand. Behind me, perhaps... Uh, Behind me, Akira made a noise and I turned to him. Look, you see? It's just as well I came by. They've got you mixed up with some other fellow and they want to kill you. For God's sake, do you still not know who I am? Akira, it's me, Christopher. I took my eyes off the crowd, turning fully to him, shone the torchlight into my face again. Then I clicked off. I saw the first time the beginnings of recognition of its face. Christopher! He said, almost experimentally, Christopher, yes, it's me. Really, it's been a long time and not a moment too soon. It would seem, Christopher, my friend, rising, rising. I looked through the crowd, then gestured to a young boy holding a kitchen knife to come closer. When I took the, the knife from him, the woman with the sickle moved threateningly towards me. I raised the revolver, shouted to her to keep her distance, then kneeling down again be beside Akira, I went about cutting his bonds. I had imagined Akira had said string because of his limited English, but I now saw he was indeed tied with all twine that that yielded easily under the blade. Tell them, I said to the old man as Akira's hands came free. Tell them he's my friend and that we are going to solve the case together. Tell them they have made a big mistake. Go on, tell them. As I turned my attention to Akira's feet, I could hear the old man muttering something and argument starting up again in the crowd. Then Akira sat up cautiously and looked at me. My friend, Christopher, he said. Yes, we friends. I sensed the crowd moving in and sprang to my feet. Perhaps, in my anxiety to, for my friend, I shouted in an unnecessarily strident tone. Don't any of you come any nearer. I'll shoot. I really will. Then turning to the old man and cried. Sorry. Where was I? Turning to the old man and cried tell them to get back tell them to get back if they know what's good for them i do not know what the old man translated in my case in any case the effect on ground whose belligerence now i now realized i had much overestimate thank you so much for dropping by thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you <coughs> I now realized I had much overestimated was utter confusion. Half of them appeared to believe I wished them over the wall to the to our left, while the remainder assumed I had commanded them to sit down on the ground. They were all clearly alarmed by my demeanor, and in the anxiety to comply, they were stumbling over one another and shouting in panic. Akira, realizing he had to seize his chance, made an attempt to climb to his feet. I hoisted him up by his arm and for a moment we stood swaying together unsteadily i was obliged to tuck the revolver back into my belt to free my other hand and then we tried to step we tried a step or two together a putrid smell was coming from his wound but pushing this out of my mind i shouted over my shoulder no longer caring how many of them understood you soon see enough you you see that you made a mistake christopher Akira murmured in my ear. My friend Christopher, look here, I said to him quietly. We have to get away from these people, that doorway over there. Do you think you can manage it? Akira, leaning heavily on my shoulder, looked into the dimness. Okay, we go.
His legs appeared unhurt and he walked reasonably well, but then after six or seven steps together, he stumbled and for a moment in our efforts to keep from collapsing in a heap, he must, we must have looked to the onlookers as though we were wrestling one another, but we managed to find a new arrangement and recommence our walk. Recommence our walk. Once a small boy ran forward to hurl some mud at us, but immediately hauled back. Then Akira and I were at the doorway. The door itself disappeared, and staggered through into the ne into the next house. Yo. We have some more to go. We have to some more to go. We have some more to go. Oh, Kiru, Kiru, Kiru went out. I guess so. Only Douglas and uh, Jin left. Chapter 20 Once we had come through two further walls and there was still no sign of our being pursued, I felt for the first time a kind of exhilaration at being finally reunited with my old friend. I found myself laughing a few times as we staggered on together. Then Akira too gave, gave a laugh and the years seemed to melt away between us. How long has it been Akira? It's been such a long time. He was moving painfully by my side, but he managed to say, A long time, yes. You know, I went back to the old house. Uh, I suppose yours is still next door. Yes, next door. Oh, have you been back too? But of course, you have been here all the time. You wouldn't see it as anything so special. Yes, he said again with some effort. Long time, next door. I brought us to a halt and set him on the remnants of the wall and then carefully removing the, the ragged jacket from his uniform. I examined his wounds again using torch and magnifying glass. I was still unable to ascertain a great deal. I had been afraid that the wound under his arm was gangrenous, but now it has now stuck, struck me that the, that the foul smell might be coming from something smeared on his clothes, perhaps from where he had been lying on the ground. On the other hand, I noted that he was alarmingly hot and utterly drenched in sweat. Removing my jacket, I tore a few strips of the lining to use as dressing. Then I, I did as my best to clean the wound with my handkerchief. Though I tried to wipe away the pus off gently as possible, the sheesh, his sharp intakes of breath told me I was causing him pain. I'm so sorry, Akira. I try to be less clumsy. Clumsy, he said, as though turning the words over. Then he suddenly gave a laugh and said, You helped me. Thank you. Of course I'm helping you, and very soon we'll get you to proper medical help. Then you'll be fine in no time. But before we do that, you have to help me. There's a very urgent task for us, and you'll see. You'll understand better than any why anyone why it's so urgent. You see, Akira, I've located it at last. The, the moment where my, your, my parents are being held. We are very near it at this moment. And you know, old chap, for a time, I was thinking I had to go into that house alone. I had done... I have done it. But really, it would have been an awful risk. Goodness knows how many kidnappers are there. I had originally reckoned on a few of these, a few Chinese soldiers to help, but that proved impossible. I was even thinking of asking the Japanese to help me, but now the, the two of us together would do it and manage the thing for sure. 
I was all this time attempting to tie the improvised bandage around his torso and neck in such a way to, as to maintain some pressure on the wound. Akira watched me carefully and when I stopped speaking, he smiled and said, Yes, I help you. You help me. Good. Uh, but Akira, I have to confess to you. I got, I've got myself rather lost. I was doing quite well until shortly before I came across you. But now, I really don't know which way to go. We have to look out for something called the East Furnace, the large thing with the chimney. I wonder, old chap, do you have any idea where we might find this furnace? Akira was continuing to look at me, his chest heaving. When I caught sight of him like that, I was suddenly reminded of the th of those times when we had so often sat together at the top of the mound in our garden, recovering our breath. I was about to mention this to him when he said, I know. I know this place. You know how to get to the East Furnace from here? He nodded. I fight here many weeks. Here, I know... Just like, he suddenly green, like my home village. I smiled too, but it, but the remark had puzzled me. Which home village is this? I asked him. Home village where I born. You mean settlement? Akira was quiet for a moment and said, "Okay, yes, settlement, international settlement, my home village." Yes, I said. I suppose it's my home village too. We both began to laugh, and for a few moments we went on giggling and laughing together, perhaps a little uncontrollably. When we had calmed down somewhat, I said, I'll tell you one odd thing, Akira. I can say this to you. All these years, all these years I've lived in England, I've never really felt at home there. The international settlement. That will always be my home. But international settlement, Akira shook his head, very fragile. Tomorrow, next day, he waved his ha a hand in the air. I know what you mean, I said. When we were in, when we were children, it seemed so solid to us. But as you put it just now, it's our home village, the only one we have. I began to put his uniform back on him, taking, uh, taking every care not to hurt him unnecessarily. Is that any better, Akira? I'm sorry, I can't do more for you just now we'll get you properly seen to very soon but now we've got we've important work to do you tell me where to go our progress was slow it was hard for me to keep the torch pointed before us and we often stumbled in the dark at great cost to akira indeed he more than once came close to losing consciousness on that lap of our journey and his weight around my shoulders grew immense nor was I without my own injuries. Most annoyingly, my right shoe had split apart and my foot was badly gashed, causing a searing pain to rise with each step. Sometimes we were so exhausted we could go no more than a dozen steps without stopping again, but we resolved all this occasion not to sit down and would stand swaying together, gasping for breath, readjusting our weights in an attempt to relieve one pain at the expense of another. The rancid smell from his wound grew, grew worse and the constant scuffling of the rats around us was unnerving. But we did not at this stage hear any sounds of fighting. I did what I could to keep our spirits up, making light-hearted remarks whenever I had the breath. In truth, tr though my feelings concerning this reunion were during those moments of a complex hue, there was no doubting my huge gratitude at fates bringing us together just in time for our great undertaking. But at the same time, a part of me was saddened that our reunion, which I had thought about for so long, should be taken in such, a grim, in such grim circumstances. It was certainly a long way from the scenes I had always conjured up of the two of us sitting in some comfortable hotel lounge or perhaps on the veranda of Akira's house overlooking a quiet garden, talking and reminiscing for hours on end. Akira, meanwhile, for all his difficulties, maintained a clear sense of our direction. Frequently, he would lead us along some route I feared would finish up in a dead end only for a doorway to opening to a, a for, uh, for a doorway or opening to appear. From time to time, we came across more inhabitants, some no more than presence we sense in the darkness. Others, gathered around the glow of a lantern or fire, would stare at Akira with such hostile, 
with ho- such hostility, I feared we would be set up, we would be set upon again. For the most part, we are allowed to we are allowed pass unmolested, and I once even managed to persuade an old woman to give us drinking water in return for the last banknotes in my pocket. The terrain changed per- perceptibly. There were no more pockets of domestic city and the only people we encountered were isolated individuals with abandoned looks in their eyes muttering or weeping to themselves nor were there any more surviving doorways but only the gouged out holes of the sort of lieutenant and i negotiated at the journey start each of this pres- of this presented us with much difficulty Akira was unable to climb through, even with me assisting his very every move without inflicting dreadful agonies upon himself. We had long since given up conversation and were simply emitting grunts in our in our time to st- in time to our steps when suddenly Akira brought us to a halt and raised his head. Then I too hear a voice, someone shouting orders. It was difficult to say how near it was, perhaps two or three houses away. Japanese? I asked in whisper. Akira went on listening and shook his head. Kuomintang. Christopher, we're now very close to to the front? Yes, the front. We're now very cr- close to the front. Christopher, this is very dangerous. It is absolutely necessary to go through this area to reach the house? Necessary. Yes, there was sudden a sudden burst of fire, rifle fire. Then, from further away, the reply of machine gun. We instinctively tightened our grabs on one another. But then Akira freed himself and sat down. Christopher, he said, we rest now. But we have to reach the house. We rest now. Too dangerous to go in the fighting zone in darkness. We will be killed. Must wait morning. I saw the sense in this, and in any case, we were now both too exhausted to go on much further. I also sat down and switched off the, the torch. I sat in the, we sat in the dark for some time, the silence broken only by our breathing. Then suddenly, the gunfire started again and for, for perhaps a minute or two continued ferociously. It ended abruptly. Then after another moment of quiet, a strange noise rose through the walls it was long thin sound like an animal's calling in a while but ended in a full-throated cry next came shrieking and sobbing and then the wounded man began to shout out actual phrases he sounded remarkably like the dying japanese soldier i had listened to earlier and in my exhausted state i assumed this must be the same man i was I was on the point of remarking to Akira what a singularly unfortunate time this this individual was having when I realized he was shouting in Mandarin, not Japanese. The realization that there were two different men rather chilled me. So identical were their pitiful whimpers, the way their scream gave way to desperate entreaties, then returned to screams, then the the notion came to me that what was the notion came to me this was what each of us would go through on our way to death that these horrible noises were as universal as the crying of newborn babies after a time i grew conscious of the fact that should be should the fighting spill into our room we were sitting in completely exposed position i was about to suggest to akira we move somewhere more hidden then notice he had fallen asleep I switched on the torchlight again and shone it about cautiously. Even by recent standards, the destruction around us was severe. I could see the granite damage, the bullet holes everywhere, smashed bricks and timber. There were dead water buffalo lying on its side in the middle of the room, no more than seven or eight yards from us. It was covered in dust and debris, a horn pointing up to the roof. I went on casting the light beam. Sorry, casting on the beam about until I had established all the possible points with from which combatants could enter our enclosure. Most importantly, I discovered on the far side of the room beyond the buffalo a little brick above which perhaps had once served as a stove or fireplace. This struck me as being the safest place for us to spend the night. 
shaking Akira awake. I put his arm around my, my neck. We both rose painfully to our feet. When we reached to the brick alcove, I pushed away some rubbles and cleared an area of smooth wooden boards sufficient to allow both of us to lie down. I spread out my jacket for Akira and carefully laid him down on his side. Then I too lay down and waited for sleep. But exhausted as I was, I conti the continuing cries of the dying man, my fears of being caught in the fight, and my thoughts of the crucial task before us all kept me from drifting off. Akira too, I could tell, remained awake, and, f and when finally I heard him sitting up, I asked him, How is your wound? My wound? No trouble, no trouble. Let me see it again. No, no, no trouble, but thank you, you good friend. Although we were only inches apart, we could not see each other at all. After a long pause, I heard him say, Christopher, you must learn to speak Japanese. Yes, I must. No, I mean, now. You learn Japanese now. Well, quite honestly, old fellow, this is hardly the ideal time to... No, you must learn. The Japanese soldier come in while I asleep. You must tell them, tell them we are, we are friend. We must tell them or they shoot in dark. Yes, I see your point. So he learned in case I, I sleep or I dead. Now look here, I don't want any of that nonsense. You are going to be as fit as a fiddle in no time. There was another pause. And I remembered how from many years ago, how Akira would fail to follow me if I used the colloquialism. So I said quite slowly. You're going to be perfectly fit, uh, perfectly well. Do you understand, Akira? I'll see to it. You're going to be well. Very kind, he said. But precaution is best. You must learn to say in Japanese. If so, if Japanese soldier come, I teach word. You remember. He began to say something in his own tongue, but it was too much to, too much, it was much too extended, and I stopped him. No, no, I'll never learn that. Something much shorter, just to make clear we are not the enemy. He thought for a moment and uttered a phrase, only slightly shorter than, than the previous one. I made an attempt, but almost immediately he said, No, Christopher, mistake. After a few more attempts, I said, Look, it's no good. Just give me one word. The word for friend. I cannot manage any more. Tonight. Tomodachi, he said. You say, Tomodachi. I repeat this word several times, and I thought perfectly accurately. Then I then realized he was laughing in the darkness. I found myself laughing also. And then, much as we had done earlier, we both began to laugh uncontrollably. We went on laughing for perhaps a long, as long as the full minute after which I believe I fell asleep quite suddenly. When I awoke, the earliest dawn light was coming into the room and it was pale bluish night, bluish light, as though just one layer of darkness had been removed. The dying man had now gone silent and from somewhere came the singing of a bird. I could now see the roof above us had largely vanished so that from where I lay, my shoulder hard against the brickwork, there were stars visible in the dawn sky. A movement caught my eye and I sat up in alarm. I then saw three or four rats moving around the dead water buffalo. For a few moments, I sat gazing at them. Only then did I turn to look at Akira, dreading what I found. He was lying beside me, quite still, and his color was very pale. But I saw with relief that he was breathing evenly. I found myself, I found my magnifying glass and began gently to examine his wound and, sudden, and succeeded in waking him. It's just me, I whispered, as he sat up slowly and glanced about him. He looked frightened and bewildered, but then he seemed to remember everything and took a numb softness in came came in uh, the look of a numb softness came into his eyes. You were dreaming, I asked. He thought he nodded, yes, dreaming. Of a better place than this, I should hope, I said with a laugh. Yes, he gave a laugh. He gave a sigh and then added a dream of when I am I am small boy. We were silent for a moment. Then I said, it must, be quite a root, it must have been quite a rude shock to come from the world you were dreaming of into this one here. He was staring at the buffalo's head, protruding out of the rubble. Yes, he said, a dream of when I am young boy. My mother, my father, young boy. 
You remember Akira? All the games we used to play on the mound in our garden? You remember Akira? Yes, I remember. Those are good memories. Yes, very good memories. Those were splendid days, I said. We didn't know it then, of course, just how splendid they were. Children never do, I suppose. Sorry. Niti. <clears throat> we didn't know it then, of course. Stretch. Yeah. Okay. Which I did just now. Oh. Children never do, I suppose. I have a child, Akira said suddenly. Boy, five years old. Really? I would like to meet him. A loose photo. Yesterday, the day before, when I wound a loose photo of son. Now look, old chap, don't get so despondent. You'll be seeing your son again in no time. He continued to stare for some time at the buffalo, a rat made a sudden movement and a cloud of flies rose up and settled again on the beast. My son, he in Japan. Oh, you sent him to Japan? That surprises me. My son in Japan, if I die, you tell him please. Tell him that you died? Sorry, I can't do that because you're not going to die. Not yet anyway. You tell him I die for country. Tell him be good to mother, protect and build good wall. He was now almost whispering, struggling to find words in English, struggling not to weep. Build good wall, he said again, moving his hand through the air like plaster smoothing a wall. His gaze followed the, the hand as though in wonder. Yes, build good world. When we were boys, I said, we lived in a good world. These children, these children we have come across. We have been coming across. What a terrible thing for them to be, to learn so early how ghastly things really are. My son, Akira said, five years old in Japan, he know nothing, nothing. He think world is good place, kind people, his toys, his mother, his father. I suppose we were like that too. But it's not all downhill. I suppose. I was, try I was trying hard now to combat the dangerous despondency settling over my friend. After all, when we were children, when things went wrong, there wasn't much we could do to help put it right. But now we are adults. Now we can. But that's the thing, you see. Look at us, Akira. After all this time, we can finally put things right. Remember, old chap, how we used to play those games over and over. How we used to pretend we were detectives searching for my father. Now we have grown and we can at last put things right. Akira did not speak for a while. Then he said, when my boy, he discovered the world is not good. I wish. He stopped either in pain or because he could not find the English. He said something in Japanese, then went on, I wish I with him to help him when he discover. Listen, you great ape, I said. This is f all far too morose. You soon, you soon, you see your soon, sorry, you see your son again soon. I'll see to that. And all this about how good the world looked when we were boys, well, it's a lot of nonsense in a way. It's just that the adults let us on. One must not get too nostalgic for childhood. Nostalgic, Akira said, as though it were a word he had been struggling to find. Then he used he said a word in Japanese, perhaps the words for J nostalgic. Nostalgic. It is good to be nostalgic. Very important. Really, old fellow? Important. Very important. Nostalgic. When we nostalgic, we remember a world better than this world we discover when we grow. We remember and wish good world come back again. So very important. Just now, I had a dream. I was boy, mother and father come close to me in our house. 
He fell silent and continued to gaze the rubble. Akira, a sense, I said, sensing that the longer this talk went on, the greater was, was some danger I did not wish to fully articulate. We should move on. We have much to do. As though in reply, there came a burst of machine gun fire. It was further away than the night before, but we were both startled. Akira, I said, is it far now from the house? We must try to reach it before the fighting starts again in the earnest. How far is it now? Not far, but we go carefully. Chinese soldier very near. Our sleep, far from refreshing us, appeared to have put made us even more depleted when we stood up akira put his weight on me the w the pain which went across my cheek sorry my neck my shoulders obliged me to let out a moan for some time until our bodies grew accustomed again walking together proved a torturous ordeal our physical conditions aside the terrain we traversed the morning was by far the most difficult yet the damage was so extensive we would frequently have to halt, unable to find a way through the debris, and while it was undeniably a help to see where we were settling down our belt, all the ghastliness that had been bedridden by the darkness was now visible to us, taking a profound toll on our spirits. Amidst the, to the wreckage, we could see blood, sometimes fresh, sometimes weeks old on the ground on the wall splash across broken furniture worse still and our noses were warmers of their presence long before our eyes we would come across with disconcerting regularities piles of human intestines in various stages of decay once we stopped by i remarked to akira about this and he simply said bayonet Soldiers always put bayonet in stomach. If you put here, he indicates the rib, bayonet not come out again. So soldier learn, always stomach. At least the bodies are gone. At least they do that much. We continued to hear occasional gunfire and each time we did so, I had the feeling that we had come a little closer to it. This concerned me, but Akira now seemed surer than ever of our route, and whenever I questioned his decision, he shook his head impatiently. By the time we came across the bodies of two Chinese soldiers, the morning sun was coming down in strong shaft through the broken roof. We did not c pass close enough to examine them properly, but my guess was that they had not been dead for more than a few hours. One was face down in the rubble and the other died on his knees, his, his forehead resting on the brick wall as though he had been overcome by melancholy. Now, at one point, my conviction that we were about to walk right into crossfire grew so strong that I stopped Akira saying, Now look here, what's your game? Where are you leading us? He said nothing but stood leaning against me, his, his head bowed, recovering his breath. Do you really know where we are going, Akira? Answer me, do you know where we are going? One moment for tea. Oh, and now Christopher Banks is angry at his friend. <sighs> Goodness. He raised his head wearily, then indicated over my shoulder. I turned. I had to do so slowly, for he was still leaning on me and saw and saw through a broken section of a wall, no more than a dozen steps away, was undoubtedly the east furnace. I said nothing, but led us over to it. Like its twin, the east furnace had survived the assault well. It was covered in dust, but looked virtually in working order. Letting go of Akira, he immediately set down some rubble. I went right up to the furnace. As on the last occasion, I could see the chimney above me was pointing towards the cloud. The clouds. I went back to where Akira was sitting and gently touched his good shoulder. Akira... I'm sorry about my tone just now. I just want you to know that I'm very grateful to you. I could never have found this place by myself. Really, Akira, I'm so grateful. Okay. His breath was now a little easier. You help me. I help you. Okay? But Akira, 
We must be very near to the house. Let me see. Along there, I indicated the alley that runs away. We have to follow the alley. Akira appeared reluctantly, reluctant to get to his feet, but I had hoisted him up and we set off again. We be I began by following what was clearly the narrow alley of the l of the left of narrow alley the, the lieutenant had pointed out from the rooftop. But almost in no time, we found ourselves completely barred by fallen debris. We climbed through a wall into a nearby house, then proceeded on what I imagine a parallel house, a parallel course, picking our way through the rubble-strewn rooms. These houses we now found ourselves in were less damaged in were less damaged and had clearly been more salubrious than those we had lately come through. There were chairs, dressing tables, even some mirrors and vases still intact amidst the wreckage. I was eager to keep going but Akira's body began to sag badly and we were obliged to stop again. We sat down on a fallen beam and it was as we were recovering our breath that my gaze fell upon the hand-painted name board lying there in the rubble before us. It had split cleanly across the grain of the wood, but the two pieces were lying there side by side. I could also see the part of lattice work which, by which it had once been fixed to the front entrance. It was not by any means the first time we had come across such a thing, but some instinct drew my attention to this particular item. I went over to it and extricating the two pieces of wood from the ma from the masonry brought them back to where we were sitting. Akira, I said, can you read this? I held the pieces together before him. He gazed at the script for a while, then said, my Chinese, not good. A, a name, someone's name. Akira, listen carefully. L look at the characters. You must know something important about them. Please try and read them. It's very important. He continued to regard the board and then shook his head. Akira, listen, I said. Is it possible that it says Ye Chen? Could, it, could that be the name written here? Ye Chen? Akira thought, looked thoughtfully. Ye Chen. Yes, possible. This character here. Yes, possible. This says Ye Chen. It does? Are you sure? Not sure, but possible, very possible. Yes, he gave a nod. Ye Chen, I think so. I put down the two pieces of, of board and made my way carefully over the rubble towards the front of the house we were in. There was a broken gap where the, where the doorway had once been, and looking through it, I could see the, the narrow alley running inside. I looked across the house directly facing me the front pages of the adjoining properties were bad were badly damaged but the house i was looking at had survived strangely intact there were hardly any obvious signs of damage the shutters on the window the crude sliding sliding wooden lattice door even the charm dangling above the doorway it had all remained unscathed after what we had traveled through it looked like an apparition from another more civilized world. I stood there staring at it for some time, then I, then I gestured to Akira. Look, come here, I said in a near whisper. This has to be the house. It can't be any other. Akira did not move but gave a deep sigh. Christopher, my you friend, I like very much. Keep your voice down, Akira. We have arrived in this house. I can feel it in my bones. Christopher... With an effort, he rose to his feet and came slowly over the, over the ground. He was, he was beside me. I pointed out to the house. The morning sun shining down the alley was causing bright streaks to fall across the front. There, Akira. There it is. He sat down by my feet and gave another sigh. Christopher, my friend, you must think carefully. In many years, many, many years. Isn't it odd? I remarked. How the fightings hardly touched that house? The house with my, with my parents in it. Uttering these words, I suddenly felt an almost overwhelmed, but I collected myself and said, Now, Akira, we have to go in. We have to do it together, arm in arm, just like that other time going into Ling Tian's room. You remember, Akira? Christopher, my dear friend, you must think carefully. 
It is many, many years. My friend, please, you listen. Perhaps, mother and father, it is now so many years. We're going together. Then, as soon as we have done what we have to do, we'll get you proper medical help. I promised. In fact, it's possible there will be something, some first aid in that house. At least some clean water, perhaps bandages. My mother will be able to look at your injuries perhaps put on a, some put on some fresh dressing for you don't you worry you'll be fine in no time christopher you must think very carefully so many years go by he fell silent as the door across the alley slid open with an with a rattle i hardly started to fumble for the revolver when the small chinese girl emerged she was perhaps six years old her face had a still expression and rather pretty. Her hair had been tied carefully into little bunches. Her simple jacket and white trousers were slightly too large for her. She looked about her, blinking in the sunlight, then looked our way. Spotting us easily, neither of us had moved. She came towards us with surprising fearlessness. She stopped in the alley just a few yards away, said something in Mandarin, gesturing back to the house. Akira, what's she saying? Not understand? Perhaps she invite us inside. But how can she be involved? Do you suppose she has something to do with the kidnappers? What's she saying? I think she asked us, she asked us to help her. Well, we'll have to tell her to stand away, I said, drawing my revolver. We have to anticipate resistance. Yes, she asked us to help. She said dog is injured. I think she said dog. My Chinese is not good. Then as we watched from somewhere near where she carefully tied her hair, tight hair began. A thin line of blood ran down over her forehead, down to her cheek. The little girl appeared to notice nothing and spoke to us again, gesturing once more back to her house. Yes, Akira said. She said dog. Dog is hurt. Her dog? She's hurt, perhaps seriously. I took I took a step towards her, intending to uh, to examine her wound, but she interpreted my movement as compliance and turning skipped back across the alley towards the door. She slid it open again, looked towards us appealingly, then disappeared inside. I stood where I stood there for a moment, hesitating. Then I reached a hand down to my friend, Akira. This is it, I said. We must go in. Let's go in now, together. Chapter 21. Oof. I tried to keep the revolver poised as we crossed the alley, but Akira's arm was around my neck and I was having to support so much of his weight that I imagined our gait as we staggered together into the house was far more authoritative. I was vaguely aware of an, an ornamental vase standing in the entranceway and I believe the decoration I had seen dangling from the door frame gave a little chiming sound as we brushed against it then i heard the, gir the girl's voice speaking and look about us although the front of the house had remained virtually untouched the whole of the back of half of the room we were in lay in ruin thinking about it today i would suppose the shell had come through the roof bringing down the upper story and destroying the rear of the house together with the property adjoining it behind but at that t at that moment, I was looking first and foremost for my for my parents, and I am not sure what exactly I I registered. My first giddy. My first 
Giddy. My first giddy thought was that the kidnappers had fled. Then I saw the bodies. My terrible fear that they were those of my mother and father, that the kidnappers had slaughtered them on account of our approach. I have to confess that my next emotion was one of great relief when I saw that, that the three crops, cops thrown about the room were all Chinese. Near the back, over the wall, was the body of a woman who, who might have been the young girl's mother. Possibly, the, the blast had thrown her there, and she was lying where she had landed. There was a shocked expression on her, on her face. One arm had been torn off at the elbow, and she was now pointing the stump up into the sky, perhaps to indicate the direction from which the shell had come from. A few yards away the, in the debris, an old lady was also gaping up at the hole in the ceiling. One side of her face was charred, and I could see no blood or obvious mutilation. Finally, closest to where we were standing, he had been obscured at first by the fallen shelf, lay a boy slightly older than the little girl we had followed in. One of his legs had been blown off at the hip, from, from where surprisingly long entrails, like decorative tails of a kite, had unfurled over the matting. Dog, Akira said beside me. I stared at him, then followed his gaze. In the center of the wreckage, not far from the dead body, the little girl had knelt down beside an injured dog, lay lying on its side and was gently caressing its fur. The dog's tail moved weakly in response. As we stood watching her, he, she glanced up and said something, her voice remaining quite calm and steady. What is she saying, Akira? I think she's saying... I think she said we help dog, said Akira. Yes, she said we help dog. Then suddenly he began to giggle helplessly. The young girl spoke again, this time addressing only me, perhaps having dismissed Akira as a lun lunatic. Then she brought her face down close to the dog's and continued to pass her, gen her hand gently over its fur. I took a step towards her, untangling myself from my friend's arm. As I did so, Akira crashed in onto, over into some broken furniture. I looked back at him in alarm, but he had continued to giggle beside the girl's pleading had gone on unbroken. Laying my revolver down on something, I went over to her, touched her shoulder. Look here, all this, I gestured in the carnage, of which she seemed completely oblivious it's awfully bad luck but look you survive and really you see you make a pretty good pretty decent show of it if you just 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 keep up your courage i look i turned to akira in irritation and shouted akira stop that noise for god's sake there's nothing to laugh about that poor girl but this girl has now grabs onto my sleeve she spoke again carefully and slowly looking into my eyes Look, really, you are being awfully brave, I swear to you. Whoever did this, whoever did this ghastly thing, they won't escape justice. You may not know who I am, but as I, as it happens, I'm, well, I'm just the person you want. I'll see to it that they don't get away. Don't you worry. I'll, I'll... I had been fumbling about in my jacket, but now I found my magnifying glass and showed it to her. You s look, you see? I kicked aside a bird cage in my path and went over to the mother. Then, perhaps out of habit as much as anything else, I began down and be I bent down and began to examine her through the glass. Her stump looked peculiarly clean. The bone protruding out of the flesh was shiny white, as almost as though someone had been had pol had been polishing it. My memory of these moments is no longer very clear, but I have a feeling it was. At this point, just after I started through, I stared through the glass at the woman's stump. That I suddenly straightened and began to search for my parents. I can only say, by the way of partial explanation for what ensued, that that Akira is still giggling where he had fallen, and the girl was continuing to make her pleas in the same even, persistent tones. In other words, the atmosphere had become fairly overwrought, and this might account to some extent for the manner in which I went about turning what was left of that little house upside down. There was a tiny room at the back, completely destroyed by the shelling, and it was here I began my search, 
pulling up broken floorboards, smashing open with the leg, with the table leg, the doors of a of an upturned cupboard. I then returned to the main room and began to heave aside the pile of wreckage, smashing with my tables, table leg, and anything that felt readily to yield to my kicks and maneuvers eventually i became aware that akira had stopped giggling and his and was following me about pulling at my shoulder and saying something in my ear i ignored him and carried on with my search not pausing when i accidentally threw over one of the bodies akira continued to pull at my shoulder and after after a time unable to comprehend why the very person i had account i had counted on to assist me was bent on hindering me i turned to him shouting something like get off me get off if you want help then just go away go off to your corner and, and giggle soldiers he was hissing at me soldiers coming get off me my mother and father where are they they're not here where are they where are they soldiers christopher stop you must come you must come or we kill christopher he was shaking me, his face, his, clip, his face close to mine. I then realized that indeed there were voices coming from somewhere close by. I allowed Akira to pull me back to the back of the room. The little girl, I noticed, had now fallen silent and was gently crad cradling the dog's head. The animal's tail was still making the occasional faint movement. Christopher, Akira said in urgent whisper, if such Chinese soldier must hide. He pointed to the to the corner. Chinese soldier must not find. But if Japanese, you must say word I teach. I can't say anything. Look, old fellow, if you're not willing to help me, Christopher, soldier, coming! Oh my God! I want to fucking punch him in the face. He tottered across the room and disappeared into a cupboard, standing at an angle in in the corner. The door was sufficiently damaged so that the whole of his shin and boot were clearly visible through the panel. It was such a pathetic attempt to hide that I began to laugh and was about to call out that I could still see him when the soldiers appeared in the doorway. The first soldier to come in fired his rifle at me but the bullet hit the wall behind me. He then noticed my raised hand and the fact that I was a foreign civilian and shouted something to his comrades who crowned in behind him they weren't japanese and the next thing i remember three or four of them began to argue about me all the time the time covering me with their rifles more soldiers came in and began to search the place i re I, re I heard akira call out from his hiding place something in japanese and then the soldiers crowded up, up around his cupboard i saw him emerge i noticed he did not seem particularly pleased to see them, nor they, they him. Other men had gathered around the little girl, also arguing what to do. Then an officer entered, and the men all stood to attention, and a silence fell over the room. The officer, a young captain, glanced around the room. His gaze fell on the child, then on me, and then settled on Akira, now supported by two soldiers. A conversation ensued in Japanese in which Akira took to himself took no part. A resigned expression with elements of fear had came into his eyes. He once tried to say something to the captain, but the latter immediately cut him off. There was another quick exchange. Then the soldiers began to lead Akira away. The fear was now very evident in his face, but he did not resist them. Akira? I called after him. Akira! Where are they taking you? What's wrong? Akira glanced back and gave me a quick, affectionate smile. Then he was gone, out into the alley, crowded from my view by the soldiers accompanying him. The, s the young captain who was looking at the child, then he turned to me and said, You Englishman? Yes. Pray, sir. What do you do here? I was... I look around. I was looking for my parents. My name is Banks, Christopher Banks. I'm a well-known detective. Perhaps you have... I did not quite know how to continue, and besides, I realized I have been sobbing for some time now, and that this was making a poor impression on the captain. I wiped my face and continued. I came here to find my parents, but they're not here anymore. I'm too late. The captain looked around once more at the debris and the corpse, the little girl and the dying dog. Then he said something to the soldier nearest to him, never taking his eyes from him. 
from me. Finally, he said to me, Pray, sir, you come with me. He made a polite but firm gesture that I should proceed precede him out into the alley. He had not holstered his pistol, but then, nor it was aimed at me, the little girl, I said, Will you take her somewhere safe? He gazed at, back at me in silence, then he said, Pray, sir, you leave now. I was on the whole look after decently. Thank you. You know? <clears throat> I was on the whole look after decently by the by the Japanese. They kept me in a little room back a little back room within their headquarters for a former fire station where I was fed and a doctor treated me for my for several injuries I had barely noticed receiving. My foot was bandaged and I was even provided with a large boot to accommodate it. The soldiers in charge of me spoke no English and appeared uncertain whether I was a prisoner or guest, but I was too exhausted to care. I lay on the camp bed they had put up in my back room and for several hours drift in and out of sleep. I was not locked in and in fact the door to the adjoining office would not close properly so that whenever I came back to consciousness I could I could hear Japanese voices arguing or else shouting down a telephone presumably about me I now suspect I was su suffering from a ma from a mal fever for much of that period whatever whatever I what uh, as I whatever as I went in and out of sleep the events not only of the past few hours of but of the last several weeks circled around my head then gradually one by one the cobwebs began to clear so that by the time i was aw awoken towards the late afternoon but by the arrival of colonel hasegawa <clears throat> i found myself i had an entirely fresh view on all that had been troubling me about the case colonel hasegawa a dapper man in his in his forties, introduced himself politely, saying, I am glad to see you are feeling so much better, Mr. Banks. I trust these men here have looked after you well. I am pleased to tell you I have come with suggestions, uh, with the instructions to escort you to the British Consulate. May I suggest we set off at once? Actually, Colonel, I said, rising gingerly to my feet, I would prefer it if you could take me somewhere else. You see, it's rather urgent. I'm not sure of the exact address, but it is not so far from Nanking Road. Perhaps it's a shop selling gramophone records. You are so eager to purchase a gramophone record? I could not be bothered to explain, so just said it's important I get there as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, sir, I have instructions to deliver you. Hey, welcome back. To deliver you to the British consulate, I fear we shall cause great inconvenience if I do otherwise. I gave a sigh. I suppose you're right, Colonel. In any case, now I think about it, I fancy I shall be too late. The Colonel, look at his wristwatch. Yes, I fear you might. But if I may suggest, if we set off straight away, then you'll be enjoying your music again with minimum delay. We traveled in an open military vehicle driven by the colonel's batman. It was a fine afternoon and the sun was beating down on the ruins of Chape. We moved slowly for for though much of the much of the debris had been cleared out of our path, there were huge piles of it on the roadside. The road was pitted with craters. Occasionally we would pass down a street with almost no sign of damage but then we would turn to the corner and the houses would be a little more than piles of rubbles and every surviving telegraph post would be standing at an odd angle between tangled cables once as we moved through such an area i found i could see a fair distance across the flattened ruins caught sight of the chimneys of the two furnaces england is a splendid country Colonel Hasegawa was saying, calm, dignified, beautiful, green fields. I still dream of it, and your literature, 
Dickens, Thackeray, Wuthering Heights, and I'm especially fond of your Dickens. Colonel, excuse me for bringing this up, but when your man found me yesterday, I was with someone, a Japanese soldier. Do you happen to know what became of him? That soldier? I am not certain what became of him. I do wonder where I might find him again. You wish to find him again? The colonel's face became serious. Mr. Banks, I would advise you not to concern yourself any more with that soldier. Colonel, has he in your eyes committed some offence? Offence? He looked at the passing ruins with a gentle smile. Almost certainly that soldier gave information to the enemy. It is likely that is how he negotiated his release from the captivity. I understand you yourself said in your statement that you found him near the Kuomintang lines that is more suggestive of cowardice and betrayal. I was about to protest, but I realized it is it was in neither Akira's nor my interest to fall out with the colonels. After I had been silent for some time, he said, It is wise not to become too sentimental. His accent which was otherwise impressive, faltered on this last word so that it came out as sentiment, sentimental. It, it rather grated on me and I turned away without responding. But a moment later, he asked in a sympathetic tone, This soldier, you met him somewhere previously? I thought I had. I thought he was a friend of mine from my childhood. But now I'm not so certain. I'm beginning to see now many things aren't I aren't as I supposed. The colonel nodded. Our childhood seems so far away now. All this he gestured to the vehicle. So much suffering. One of our Japanese poets, a court lady many years ago, wrote about how sad this was. She wrote about how our childhood become like a foreign land once we have grown. Colonel? Well, Colonel? It's hardly a foreign land to me. In many ways, it's where I have continued to live all my life. It's only now I've started to make my journey from it. We passed through the, the we passed through the Japanese checkpoints into Hongkyu, the northern district of the settlement. In this region too, there were signs of war damage as well as the as those of anxious military preparation. I saw many piles of sandbags and tracks filled with soldiers as we approached the canal. The can as we uh, as we approached the canal, the colonel said, "Like yourself, Mr. Banks, I am very fond of music, in particular Beethoven, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Chopin too. The third sonata is marvelous. A cultured man like you, Colonel, I remark, must regret all this. I mean, all this carnage caused by your country's invasion of China." I feared he would become angry, but he smiled calmly and said. It is, agree re it is regrettable, I agree, but if Japan is to become a great nation like yours, Mr. Banks, it is necessary, just as it was once for England. We were silent for a few moments, then he said, I am sure yesterday in Japan you saw unpleasant things? Yes, I certainly did. Suddenly he let out a strange laugh, which made me start. Mr. Banks, he said, do you realize... Do you have any idea of the unpleasantness yet to come? If you continue to invade China, I am sure. Excuse me, sir. He was quite animated. I'm not talking about merely China. The entire globe, Mr. Banks, the entire globe will, before long, be engaged in a war. What you just saw in Chape, it is but a small speck of dust compared to what the world must soon witness. He said this in a triumphant note, and then he shook his head sadly. It will be terrible, he said quietly. Terrible. You have no idea, sir. I do not remember clearly those first hours following my return, but I would suppose my arrival in the grounds of the, Japan of the British consulate conveyed by a Japanese military vehicle and looking more or less like a tramp li did little for the morale of an anxious community. I remember vaguely the officials rushing out to meet us and then as I was taken into the building, the look on the face of the consul general as he came hurrying down the stairs. 
I do not know what was his first words were, but I do recall saying to him, perhaps even before greeting had passed my lips, Mr. George, I must ask you to let me see your man, MacDonald, without delay. MacDonald? John MacDonald? Why do you wish to talk to him, old fellow? Look, what you need is to rest up. We'll have a doctor look you over. I accept, but I accept I'm looking a little far worse for wear, don't worry. I'll go and freshen up a little, but please have McDonald ready for me. I am. It's very important. I was shown to a guest room in the consulate building where I managed to shave an, a hot bath despite a whole series of people knocking on my door. One of those was a dour Scottish surgeon who examined me for a good half hour, convinced I was concealing some serious injury from him. Others came to ask after one and or another aspect of my welfare, and I sent at least three of them back with an impatient query concerning MacDonald. I received only vague replies about his not yet having been located. And then, as the evening drew on, exhaustion or perhaps something the surgeon had given me sent me off on into a deep sleep. I did not awake until well into the following morning. I did. I, I had breakfast brought to my room, changed into fresh clothes delivered from the cafe while I had been asleep. I then felt a lot better and I decided I would go and seek out McDonald there, then and there. I thought I could remember the way to McDonald's office from our last meeting, but the consulate building was rather deceptive and I obliged to ask directions from the number of people I encountered. I was still a little lost making my way down a flight of stairs when I noticed a figure of Sir Cecil Mathers standing on the landing below me. The morning sun was streaming down the tall landing windows, lighting up the area the large area of grey stones around him. There was no one else on the landing, and Sir Cecil was stooping forward slightly, hands clasped behind his back, gazing down on the consulate grounds above, uh, consulate grounds below. I was tempted to retreat back up to the stairs, but it was a quiet part of the building, and there was a chance my footsteps would make him look up at any moment. I thus continued my descent, and as I came up to him, he turned as though he had been aware all along of my approach. Hello, old fellow, he said. Heard you were back. A bit of a panic when you went missing, I'll tell you. Feeling better? Yes, I'm fine, thanks. Just this foot's a little awkward. Won't fit in won't fit into my shoe. The sun in his face made him look old and tired. He turned he turned back to the window again and peered out, moving alongside him at I too look out. Below us, three sick policemen were hurrying back and forth across the lawn, stacking sandbags into piles. You you heard she's gone? Sir Cecilia asked. Yes. Of course. When you went missing at the same time, I jumped into conclusions. So did a few other people, I fancy. That's why I came along this morning to offer you my apologies. But it, but they told me you were sleeping, so I was just, well, just kicking my heels here. There's no need, no need for any apologies, Sir Cecil. Oh yes, there is. I fancy I went around saying a few things like the other evening, you know, jumping to conclusions, but... Of course, everyone knows now I was making a fool of myself, but all the same, I thought I'd be, I'd, I had better come along and explain myself. Down on the lawn, a Chinese coolie arrived with a wheelbarrow containing more sandbags. The sick policeman began unloading them. Did she leave a letter? I asked, trying to sound nonchalant. No, but I did receive a cable this morning. She's in, a, she's in Macau, you know. Says that she's safe and well. Says she's by herself and she'll be writing soon. Then he turned to me and grabs my elbow. Thanks. I know you'll miss her too in some ways, you know. I preferred it if she had gone off with you. I know she she thought jolly well of you. It must have come as a big shock, I remarked, for want of something to say. Sir so still turned away and for and for some time, went on gazing down at the policeman. Then he said, wasn't really. To tell you the truth, no shock at all. Then he went on. I w always told her she should go. Told her she should go and find love, you know. True love. She deserves it, don't you think? That's where she has gone off now. Off to find true love. 
Perhaps she'll find it too out there on the South China Sea. Who knows? Perhaps she'll meet a, a traveler in a port in a hotel. Who knows? She's become a romantic, you see. I had to let her go. There were now tears swelling in his eye. What will you do now, sir? I asked gently. What will I do? Who knows? Ought to go home. I expect. I suppose that's what I'll do. Go home. Just, just as soon as I've paid off a few debts here, that is. I had been conscious of footsteps counting, coming down from the stairs behind us. But now they slowed to a halt and we both of us turn. I was rather dismayed to see Grayson, the official form from the un from the municipal council. Good morning, Mr. Banks. Good morning, Sir Cecil. Mr. Banks, we are so, so pleased to see you are back and safe. Thank you, Mr. Grayson. And when he continued simply to stand there, in the bottom stair, smiling foolishly, I added, I trust the arrangement for the Jessville Park ceremony are progressing to your satisfaction. Oh, yes, yes. He gave a vague laugh. But just now, Mr. Banks, I come to find you because I've heard that you are wishing to speak to McDonald's. Yes, that's right. In fact, I was just on my way to find him. Ah, yes. He won't be in his usual office. If you have followed me, sir, I'll take you to him now. I gave Sir Cecil a gentle squeeze on the shoulder. shoulder. He had turned back to the window to hide his tears, then followed Grace Grayson with an eager step. He led me through the deserted section of the building, and then we came to a corridor containing a row of offices. I could hear someone talking on the phone, and a man emerged from one of those doors, nodded to Grayson. Grayson opened another door and waved for me to go in ahead of him. I stepped into a small but well-appointed office dominated by a large desk. But Grace, I, st I st stopped at the threshold where there was no one in the room. But Grayson nudged me further in and closed the door. He then walked around the desk and sat down and gestured towards the empty seat. Mr. Grayson, I said, I have no time for these foolish pranks. I am sorry. Grayson said, I know you wish to see MacDonald, but you see, MacDonald's domain is protocol. He discharged his duties very well, but his territory doesn't really extend any further. I sigh with impatience, but before I could speak, Grayson went on. You see, old chap, when you say you wanted, Mac wanted MacDonald, I assume you wanted me. I'm the fellow you need to speak to. I then noticed there was um, something different about Grayson. Grayson. His ingra his ingratiating is he is ingratiate ingratiating ingratiating air had vanished and he was what he was watching me with steadily over the desk. When he f saw understanding dawn in my face, he gestured once more to the chair. Please make yourself comfortable, old chap, and I do apologize for having rather dogged you since your, uh, your arrival here. But, you see, I had to make sure you didn't make, do anything to cause a big stink with other powers. Now, let me see. I take it you want a meeting with the yellow snake. Yes, Mr. Grayson, I, want, I wonder if you can arrange such a thing. As it happens, we finally got the word that you... Got a word while you're away. Our party seems now to grant your request. Then, lean, leaning forward, he said to me, So, Mr. Banks, do you feel you are closing in? Yes, Mr. Grayson. At last, I believe I am. So, it was that just after 11 o'clock that night, I found myself traveling by car through the elegant residential areas of the French concession in the company of two officers from the Chinese police, Chinese secret, secret police, we went down the avenues lined with trees, past large houses, some entirely hidden behind high walls and hedges. Then we came through gates heavily guarded by men and in gowns and hats and halted in a graveled courtyard. A dark house, four or five stories high, stood before us. Inside, the, light, the lights were low and more guards lurked everywhere in the shadows. As I followed my escorts up to the central staircase, I gained an impression to the house had had until recently belonged to a wealthy European, but now, but had now for some reasons fallen into the hands of Chinese authorities. I could see crude notices and 
schedules pinned up on the walls right alongside exquisite works of Chinese and and Western arts. To judge from its decor, the room I was shown up into up on to the second floor had until recently contained a billiard table. There was now a yawning space in the middle of the room around which I paced while I waited. After twenty minutes or so I heard the sound of mere cars driving down in the courtyard and but but when I tried to see out the windows I found this gave this gave on the garden the side of the house and I could see nothing at all of the front. It was perhaps another half an hour before I, w- I finally I was finally fetched. I was escorted up another flight of stairs and then along a corridor past more guards then my, my escort stopped and one of them pointed to a door several yards before us. I went the last lap alone and entered what finally appeared to be a large study. There was thick carpet beneath my feet and the walls were almost entirely lined with books. As far as the end, where the heavy drapes had been drawn across the bay windows, was a desk with with a chair on either side of it. A reading lamp on the desk created with created a warm pool of light, but otherwise much of the room was in shadow. As I stood surveying my surroundings, a figure rose behind the desk and stepping carefully around it, gestured back to the chair he had vacated. Why don't you take this seat, Puffin? Uncle Philip said to me. You remember, don't you? You always love to sit in my chair behind my desk. Whoa! Someone familiar has turned up. Damn, son! <laughs> He's being kidnapped. Kiru's being kidnapped a lot. <laughs> Chapter 22, second last chapter of the book. Chapter 22 Had I not been expecting to see him, it is perfectly possible I would have failed to recognize Uncle Philip. He had put on weight over the years, so that though he was not stout, his neck has thickened and his cheeks were sagging. His hair was wispy and white, but his eyes were calm and humorous in much the way I remembered. I did not smile as I came towards him, nor did I go behind the desk to the chair he had offered. I'll sit here, I said, stopping behind, beside the other chair. Uncle Philip shrugged. Well, it's not my desk anyway. In fact, I've never set a foot in this house before. Something to do with you, this place? I've never been here before either. May I suggest we sit down? When I when we did so, we could see each other clearly for the first time in the light of, in the light from the desk lamp, and we spent a moment carefully studying one another's features. You haven't changed much, you know, Puffin. He said, "Easy to see the boy in you even now." I appreciate you not calling me by that name. Sorry, rather cheeky, I admit. So here we are. You managed to track me down. I kept refusing to meet you before, but in the end, I suppose I began to want to see you again. Owe you an explanation or two, I expect. But I wasn't sure, you see, how you regarded me. Friend or foe, that sort of thing. But then, these days, I'm not sure about most people on that score. Do you know, they told me to keep this with me, just in case. He produced a light silver pistol and held it up to the light. Can you believe it? They thought you might wish to attack me. But I see you brought it along just the same. Oh, but I carry it everywhere. So many people wanting to do our mis- do me mischief these days. I didn't really bring it on your account. 
one of those men standing out there. Perhaps he has been bribed to burst in here and stab me. Who can tell? That's the way it has been for me, I am afraid, ever since this yellow snake lock started. Yes, it would seem that you have given you have much given to treachery. That's a bit harsh. If you're implying what I think you are implying, as far as the communists are concerned, very well. Yes, I've turned traitor. Even there, it was never my intention, you know. Chiang's man got hold of me one day and threatened to torture me. I admit, I did not. I did not fancy that much. Didn't fancy it one bit. But in the end, they did a far cleverer thing. They tricked me into betraying one of my number. And then you see, that was that. Because as you have seen, no one punishes turncoats more savagely than my own co old comrades. There was, no e there was no other way for me to stay alive. I had to depend on the government to protect me from my comrades. According to my, info in according to my investigations, I said, a lot of people have lost their lives through you, and not just those you betrayed. There was a time a year ago when you allowed the communists to believe Yellow Snake was another man. Many of his family members, including three men and including three children, were killed in the first wave of reprisals. I don't consider myself admirable. I'm a coward and I have known it for a long time, but I can hardly be held accountable for those raids savage savagery. They have proved themselves every bit as vicious as Chiang Kai-shek ever was and I have no respect left for them. But look here, I don't expect you to come to talk about all this. No, I didn't. So Puffin, I'm sorry, Christopher. So what shall I tell you? Where shall we begin? My parents, where are they? Your father? I'm afraid he's dead. Has been many years. I'm sorry. I said nothing and waited. Eventually he said, Tell me, Christopher, what do you believe happened to your father? Is it any business of yours, what I believe? I came here to hear it from you. <laughs> Very well. But I was curious to know what you have worked out for yourself. After all, you have made quite a name for yourself for such a thing. This irritated me. But it occurred to me that he would for would be forthcoming only on, on his own terms. So in the end, I said, my conjecture has been that my father made a stand, a courageous stand, against his own employers concerning the profits from the opium trades of all those years. In doing so, I suppose he set himself against enormous interests and thus removed. Uncle Philip nodded. I would suppose you believe something like that. Your mother and I discussed carefully what to have you believe, and it was more or less what you have just said. So we were successful. The truth is, I'm afraid, Puffin, was more, was much more prosaic. Your father ran off one day with his mistress. He lived with her in Hong Kong for a year, a woman called Elizabeth Cornwallis. But Hong Kong was awfully stuffy and British, you know. They were a scandal. And in the end, they had to rush off to Malacca or some such place. Oh my god. Sorry. I just got shocked with the location. Then he got typhoid and died in Singapore. That was two years after he left you. I'm sorry, old fellow. It's hard to hear all this, I know. But brace yourself, because I've, uh, I have a lot more to tell you before this evening's out. You say my mother knew at the time? Yes, not at first, mind you. Not for a good month or so. Your father covered his tracks well. Your mother only found out because he wrote to her. She and I were the only ones who ever knew the truth. But the detectives... How on earth did the detective fail to discover what he had done? The detectives? Uncle Philip let out a laugh. Those underpaid, overworked, flat feet? They wouldn't have found an elephant gone missing in Nanking Road. Then, when I remained silent, he said, She would have told you eventually, but... We wanted to protect you, that's why we had you believe what you did. I had started to feel uncomfortable sitting so close to the desk clamp and, and the upright chair did not allow me to sit back. 
Then, after I had maintained my silence for another few moments, Uncle Philip said, Let me be fair to your father. It was difficult for him. He always loved your mother, loved her intensely. I'm jolly sure she never, he never stopped loving her right to the end. In some ways, Puffin, that was the trouble. He loved her too much, idealized her, and it was just too much for him trying to come up to what he saw her as Mark. He tried, oh yes, he tried, and it nearly broke him. He might have just said, look here, I can only do so much and that's it, it's who I am. But he adored her, wanted desperately to make himself good enough for her, and when he found he didn't have it in him, well, he went off. With someone who didn't mind him as he was, it's my belief that he just wanted rest. He tried. He had tried so hard for so many years, he just wanted to rest. Don't think so badly of him, Puffin. I believe he had, he ever stopped. I don't believe he ever stopped loving your mother or you. And my mother? What has become of her? Uncle Philip leaned forward on his elbows and tilted back, tilted him back his head slightly. How much you already know about her? He asked. The lightness he had earlier contrived to place in his voice had evaporated altogether. He now looked at the haunted man, consumed with self-hatred. He was gazing at me carefully despite his tilted head, and the yellow light from the desk lamp showed white whiskers growing out of his nostrils. From somewhere downstairs, I could hear a phonograph playing Chinese martial music. I'm not trying to annoy you, he said, when I did not answer. I don't want to hear myself talking any more about it than I have to. Come on, how much have you found out? I was until recently under the, the impression both of my parents were being held captive in Sharpe. So you see, I have not been so clever. I waited for him to speak. He, he remained in his curious posture and for some time then sat back and said, You won't remember this, but shortly after your father went away, I came to your house to see your mother, and a certain man came also that day, a Chinese gentleman. You're referring to the, you're referring to the warlord Wang Ku. Ah, then you haven't been so foolish. I found out his name, but after, thereafter I suspect I've been too busy following a false trail. He gave a sigh and cocked his ear. Listen, he said. Kuo Min Tang Antons. They play them to, to tease me. Wherever they take me, it's like this. Happens too often to be coincidence. Then when I said nothing, he rose to his feet and wandered into the shadows towards the heavy curtains. Your mother, he said eventually, was devoted to our campaign to stop the opium trade into China. Many European countries, including your fathers, were making vast profits importing in importing Indian opium into China and turning millions of Chinese into helpless addicts. In those days, I was one of those central to the campaign. For a long time, our strategy was rather naive. We thought we could shame those companies into giving, their, giving up their opium profits. We wrote letters, pre presented them with evidence showing the damage opium has caused Has, was causing to the Chinese people. Yes, you may laugh. We were very naive. But you see, we thought we were dealing with fellow Christians. Well, eventually, we saw we were getting nowhere. We discovered that these people, they, are, they not only liked the prophets very much, they actually wanted the Chinese to be useless. They liked them to be in chaos, drug addicted, unable to govern themselves properly. That way, the country could be run virtually like a colony and with none of the usual obligations. So we changed our tactics. We grew more sophisticated. In those days, just as they do still, the opium shipments came along the Yangtze. Boats had to bring them upriver through the bandit, bandit country. Without adequate protection, the shipments wouldn't get much beyond the Yangtze gorges without being marauded. So all these companies, Morgan Brook and Bayer, Jardin Matheson, all of them, they used to make deals with the local warlords through whose territories the shipments passed. 
these warlords were just glorified ban bandits, really. But they had armies, they had the power to see the shipments through. So here was our new strategy. No longer did we plea with the trading companies, we pleaded with the warlords, appealed to their racial pride. We pointed out it was in their hands to end the profitability of the opium trade, to reverse the one other the one major obstacle to the Chinese taking command of their own fate, their own land. Huh. Of course, some were too keen on the payments they received, but we had some converts. Wang Ku was at the time one of the most powerful of these bandit slots. His territory covered several hundred square miles in the north of Hunan, a pretty, a pretty brutal chap, but sufficiently feared and respected to make him valuable indeed to the trading companies. Now, Wang Ku became very sympathetic to our, our cause. He often came to Shanghai, liked the high life here, and we, were, and we were able to prevail on him during these visits. Puffin, are you well? Yes, I'm listening. I'm fine. Perhaps you should go now, Puffin. You don't have to hear what I'm going to tell you. Tell me, I'm listening. Very well. My feeling is that you should hear it even if you can bear it because, well, because you must find her. There's still a chance you can find her. So my mother is alive? I have no reason to suppose otherwise. Then tell on. Go on with what you are saying. He came back to the desk and sat down once more in front of me. The day Wang Ku came to your house, he said, It's fitting you should remember that day. You are quite right. To suspect it was important. It was the day your mother discovered that Wang Ku's motives were far from pure. Put simply, he planned to seize opium shipments himself. Of course, he made it. He had made complicated arrangements so that it went through three or four pa other parties. Very Chinese that. But in the end, yes, that's what it amounted to. Most of us already know this, but your mother didn't. We kept her in the dark, perhaps foolishly, because we sensed she would not accept it. The rest of us naturally had qualms, but we decided to work with Wang, with Wang Ku, nevertheless. Yes, he would sell the opium to the same people the trading companies did, but the important thing was, was to stop the imports, to make the trade unprofitable. Unfortunately, that day, Wang Ku came to your house, he said something that for the first time made clear to your mother that the reality of his relationship with us. My guess is that she felt foolish. Perhaps she had ex suspected it all along, but hadn't wished to look at it and was as angry with herself as with me as she was with Wang. In any case, she quite lost her temper, actually struck him. Only lightly, you understand? But her hand did touch his cheek. And of course, she said everything she had to say to his face. I knew then some terrible price would have to be paid. I tried to sort the thing out then and there. I explained to him how your father had just left and your mother was really upset. I tried to convey all of this, convey all of this to him as he left. He smiled and said not to worry. But I worried, oh yes, I worried all right. I knew that what your mother had done wouldn't, couldn't be undone so easily. I had been relieved to, I tell you, if Wang had done in response was to stop participating in, your, in our plan. But he wanted the opium and he had already made plenty of arrangements. Besides, he had been insulted by a foreign woman. He wanted to put things right. As I leaned towards him into the glare of the light, an odd feeling came over me that behind my back, the darkness had grown and grown so that the vast black space had opened up there. Uncle Philip had paused to wipe some sweat from his forehead with the heel of the hand, but now he looked at me intently and continued. I went to see Wang Ku later at the Metropole. I did what I could to try to stop the calamity I knew would come, but it was no use. When, what he told me that afternoon was that far from being angered by your mother, he had found her spirit, that's what he called it, her spirit, highly attractive. So much so that he wished to take her back as a concubine back to Hunan. He probably, he proposed to tame your mother as he would ma a Mao mare. 
Now you must understand, Parfin, the way things were in China, in Shanghai, in China. If a man like Wang Ku decided a course like that, there was little annoy, a little anyone could do to stop him. That's what you must understand. Nothing at all would have been achieved by asking the police or whoever to guard your mother. That might be slowing, that might be slowed things down a little. But that's all. There was no one who could protect your mother from the intentions of a man like that. But you see, Puffin, my great fear was for you. I wasn't sure what he intended to do with you, and that's what I'm really pleading for. In the end, we came to an agreement. I would arrange things so that your mother was alone and guarded. If at that same time, I could take you right away from the scene. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't want him to take you too. Your mother, that was an inevitability. But for you, there was something to plead for, and that's what I did. There was a substantial pause, and I said, "After after this convenient arrangement, do I take it Wang Ku continued to cooperate with your scheme? Don't be cynical, Puffin. But did he? As it happened, he did. Taking your mother satisfied him." He did as we wished him to do, and I dare say his contribution was a factor in the company's eventual decision to end the trade. So my mother, as you might say, sacrificed for a greater cause. Look, Puffin, it wasn't anything any of us had a choice about. You must understand that. Did you ever see my mother again after she was abducted by this man? I saw him hesitate, but then he said, "Yes, as a matter of fact, I did." Only seven years later, I happened to be traveling through Hunan and accepted Wang's invitation to be his guest. And there, in his fortress, yes, I did see your mother one last time. His voice was now almost a whisper. The phonograph downstairs were no longer playing, so a stillness hung between us. And and what became of her? She was in good health. She was, of course. One of several concubines under the circumstances, I would say she had adapted well to her new life. How had she been treated? Uncle Philip looked away. Then he said quietly, "When I saw her, she asked of you naturally. I told her I told her the news I had. She was pleased, you see. Until I saw her that time, she had been utterly cut off from the outside world. For seven years, she had only heard." What Wang Ku chose to have her here, what I mean is, she didn't know for certain the financial arrangement was working. So I saw her. That's what she wanted to know, and I was able to reassure her that it was. After seven years of tortures, doubt, her mind was put at rest. I can't tell you how re how relieved she was. That's all I wanted to know. She kept saying, "That's all I wanted to know." He was watching me now very carefully. After another mo moment, I gave him the question for which he was waiting. Uncle Philip, what financial arrangement? One sip of tea. He looked down at the back of his hand and studied them for a while. I read it not for you. Her love for you, Puffin. Your mother, I know, would have taken her own life without a moment's hesitation before allowing the scoundrel to lay a finger on her. She would have found a way, and she would have done it. But there was you to consider. So in the end, when she saw the situation for what it was, she made an arrangement. You would be financially provided for in return for her, for her compliance. I saw too much of it myself. Arranged through it. Through the company, there was a man there at Bayet's. Didn't have a clue what it's all about. Thought he was securing safe passage for his opium. <laughs> he was a fool, that man. Uncle Philip shook his head and smiled. Then his face darkened again, as though he he were now resigned to, to the cost of our of our to the cost our conversation would take. My allowance, I said, my inheritance. Your aunt in England, she was never wealthy. Your real benefactor all these years has been Wang Ku. So all these years, I've been living, I've been living off. I, I could not go on and simply stop. Uncle Philip nodded. Your schooling, your place in London society, the fact that you made of yourself what you have, you owe it. 
to Wang Ku, or rather, to your mother's sacrifice. He stood up again, and when he looked at me, I saw something new in his face, something almost like hatred. Then he turned and moved away into the shadows, and I could see it no more. That last time, that, that time I, I last saw your mother, he said, in that fortress, she had lost all concern for the opium check campaign. She only lived for you, worried for you. By that time, the trade had been made illegal, but even the news meant nothing to her anymore, of course. I was bitter about it, as were the others of us who had given years to the campaign. We had finally achieved our goals, we thought. Opium trade abolished only took a year or two to see what abol abolition really meant. The trade had simply changed hands. That was all. It was now run by Chiang's government. More addicts than ever. But now it was being peddled to pay for Chiang Kai-shek's army, to pay for his power. That's, why, that's when I joined the Reds, Puffin. Your mother. I thought she would be dev devastated to know what our campaign had amounted to. But she no longer cared. All she wanted was for you to be looked after. She only wanted news of you. Do you know, Puffin? His voice suddenly took a strange edge. When I saw her that, that when I saw her that time, she seemed well enough. But while I was there, I asked others in the household, people who would know. I wanted to find out the truth, find out wh how she had been really been treated. Because, because I knew that one day, this moment, this meeting that we are having now was bound to come. Uh, and I found out, oh yes, I found out everything. Are you deliberately trying to torment me? I said. It was just, just a matter of surrendering to him in bed. He regularly whipped her in front of his dinner guest, taming the white woman he called it. And that wasn't all. Do you know? I had already covered my ears and now shouted, Enough! Why torture me like this? Why? His voice was now angry. Why? Because I want you to know the truth. All these years, you thought of me as a despicable creature. Perhaps I am. But it is what this world does to you. I never meant to be like this. I meant to do good in this world. In my way, I once made courageous decision. And look at me now. You despise me. You have despised me all these years, Puffin. The closest thing I ever had to a son. And you despise me still. And now do you see how the world really is? You see what made possibly your possible your comfortable life in England? Have you ever able to become a ce celebrate de celebrated detective? A detective? What good is that to anyone? Stolen jewels, aristocrats murdered for their inheritance. Do you suppose that that's all there is to contend with? Your mother, she wanted you to live in your enchanted world forever, but it is impossible. In the end, it has to shatter. It's a miracle it survived so long for you. Now puff in here. I'll give you this chance here. He had taken out his pistol again. He came from the shadows towards me. When I looked up, he was looming over me, uh, much as he had done in my childhood. He flung his jacket and pressed the pistol into the waistcoat near his heart. Here, he said, bending down and whispering to him, whispering so I could smell his stale breath. Here, boy, you can kill me, as you have always wanted to. That's why I've stayed alive so long. No one else should have that privilege. I've saved myself, you see, for you. Pull the trigger. Here, look. We'll make it appear as if I attacked you. I'll be holding the gun. I'll be all over you. When they come in, they'll see my body collapse over you. It looks like self-defense. Here, see, here. I'm holding it. You pull the trigger, Puffin. His waistcoat was pushing against my face, moving up and down with his heaving chest. I felt a revulsion and tried to move away. But his free hand, the skin felt indescribably 
parched and grasped my arm in, in an effort to draw me to him, it occurred to me that he would pull the trigger himself if my hand so much as to touch the pistol. I pulled back violently, unbalancing my chair, and staggered away from him. For a moment, for a second, we, we both glanced guiltily towards the door to see if the commotion would bring in guards, but nothing happened, it, and eventually... Uncle Philip laughed and picking up the chair, positioned it carefully in front of the desk that he sat on it himself. Put the, gun, put the pistol down on the desk and spent some time recovering his breath. I took a few more steps away from the desk, but there was nothing else in the cavernous room and I simply came to a stop. My back still turned to him, then I heard him say, All right, very well. He took a few more gulps of air. Then I'll tell you, I'll make you Madaka's confession. But for the next minute, I could hear, all I could hear behind me was his heaving breathing. Then he said, very well, I'll confess to you about why I allowed Wang Ku to, to kidnap your mother that day. What I said before, yes, it's true, I have to safeguard you. Yes, yes, everything I said earlier more or less stands, but if I really wanted too. I would really wanted to save your mother. I know I would have found a way to do so. I'll tell you something now, Puffin. Something I was able to confess even to myself many years later. I helped Wang to take your mother because part of me wanted her to become his slave. To be used like that night after night because you see, I always lusted over her right from the days when I came to be a lodger in your house. Oh, yes, I desired her. And when your father went off like that, I believe it was my chance that I, be that I, that I was his natural successor. But but you're not your mother. She never looked at me like that. I realized it after your father went away. She respected me as someone decent. No, no, it was impossible. Not in a thousand years could I have put myself forward to her. Not in, not in that sort of way. And I was angry. I was so angry. And when it all happened with Wang Ku, it excited me. Do you hear me, Puffin? It excited me. After he took her away, in the darkest hours of night, it excited me. All those years, I lived vicariously through Wang. It's almost as though I had conquered her too. I gave myself pleasure many, many times, imagining for myself what was happening to her. Now, now, kill me. Why spare me? You've heard it. Here, shoot me like a rat. For a long time... I went on standing in a darkened part of the room, my back to him, listening to his breathing. Then I turned to him again and said quite quietly, You said earlier you believe my mother was still alive. Is she still with Wang Ku? Wang died four years ago. His army, in any case, was disbanded by Chiang. I don't know where is she now, Puffin. I honestly don't. Well, I shall find her. I shan't give up. It won't be easy, my boy. There's a war waging raging through the country. It will soon engulf the whole world of it. Yes, I said. I dare say it will soon engulf the whole world, but that's not my fault. In fact, it's no longer my concern. I mean to start again, and this time to find her. Is there anything else you can tell me to help with my search? I'm afraid not, Puffin. I've told you everything. Then goodbye, Uncle Philip. I'm sorry I'm not obliged. I'm not able to oblige you. Don't worry. No shortage of people willing to oblige Yellow Snake. He gave a quick laugh. Then he said in a weary voice, Goodbye, Puffin. I hope you find her. <sighs> that was the end of chapter 22. I have one more chapter to go. I want to take a quick bathroom break. Be right back. Dangerous. Dangerous.
Part Seven. Last part. Part Seven. London. London. Fourteenth of November, nineteen fifty-eight. That's a jump from nineteen thirty-seven. That's a huge jump. We are losing like two decades here. So part seven, London, fourteen November, nineteen fifty-eight. That's after the World War Two. Many many years after the World War Two. Ten years or so after the World War Two. And chapter, and we are going to read the last chapter, chapter twenty-three. Are you guys ready to finish it up? I am ready. I need to work. <laughs> I'm a very busy woman. Okay, let's go. Chapter twenty-three. It was my first long trip in many years, and for two days after our our, our arrival in Hong Kong, I remained quite fatigued. Air travel is impressively fast, but the conditions are cramped and disorienting. My hips pain returned with a vengeance, and a headache lingered for much of my stay, which no doubt jaundiced my view of the colony. I know of those who have made the trip out there and returned full praise. A forward-looking place, they say, and astonishingly beautiful. Yet, for much of that week, the skies were overcast and the streets oppressively crowded. I suppose I did appreciate here and there in the Chinese signs outside the shops, or just in the sight of the Chinese going about their business in the markets, some vague echo of Shanghai. But then again, such echoes were more often. And not discomforting. It was as though I had come upon, at one of those dullish supper parties I attended in Kensington on Bayswater, a distant cousin of a woman I once loved, whose gestures, facial expression, little shrugs nudged the memory, but who remains overall an awkward, even grotesque parody of much cherished image. I was in the end glad of Jennifer's company. When she had first hinted that she'd come with me, I had deliberately ignored her. For even by that late stage, I'm speaking of only five years ago, she was tending to regard me as some sort of invalid, especially whenever the past or else the Far East reemerged in my life. I suppose a part of me had long resented the over solicit solicit over solicit. Terseness, solicitiousness, solicitiousness. Oh my God! And it was only when it occurred to me she genuinely wished to get away from things for a while, and that she had her own worries that such a trip might do her good. And I agreed we should travel together. It had been Jennifer's suggestion that we try to try and extend our journey to Shanghai. I suppose this would not have been impossible. I have been. I I could have spoken to the few old acquaintances, men who still have influence at the Foreign Office, and I am sure I we we could have gained gain entry into mainland China without undue difficulty. I know of others who have just done that, but then, by all accounts, Shanghai today is a ghostly shadow of the past. Of the city,、uh, ghostly shadow of the city it once was, the communists have refrained from physically tearing it down, so that much of what was once the national, the international settlement remains intact. The streets, though renamed, are perfectly recognizable, and it is said that anyone familiar with the Shanghai of old would know his way about there. But foreigners, of course. Have been all banished, and what were lavish hotels and nightclubs are now the bureaucratic offices of Chairman Mao's government. In other words, the Shanghai of today is likely to prove no less painful of the parody's old city than it did Hong Kong. I have heard, incidentally, that much of the poverty and also the opium addiction against which my mother once battled so hard has receded. Significantly under the communist, 
how deeply these evils have been eradicated remains to be seen, but it would certainly appear that communism has been able to achieve in a handful of years what philanthropy and ardent campaigning could not in decades. I remember wondering to myself what my mother would have done, would have made of such a reflection that the first night we spent in Hong Kong, as I paced myself around my room in the Excelsior Hotel, nursing my hips and trying to trying in general to regain equilibrium. A moment for coffee. I did not go to the Rosdale Manor until our third day. It had been it had long been understood that I would make the trip alone and Jennifer though she watched me she watched my every move throughout the morning, saw me off after lunch with no undue fuss. That afternoon, the sun had actually broken through, and as I climbed the hill slopes in my taxi, the, mel- the well-manicured lawns on each side were being watered and, and mown by teams of gardeners stripped to their vests. Eventually, the ground leveled off, and the taxi pulled up in front of a large white house built in a in the British colonial style, with a long rows of shuttered windows and an additional wing sprawling on its side. It must once have been a splendid residence, overlooking as it did the water and much of the west side of the island. When I stood in the breeze and looked across the harbour, I could see right into the distance to where a cable car was climbing a faraway hill. Turning to the house itself, however, I saw it had been allowed to grow shabby, the paint on the white ledges and door, in, door and door frames, in particular, had been had cracked and peeled. Inside, in the hallway, there there was a faint smell of boiled fish, but the place looked spotlessly clean. A Chinese nun led me down an echoing corridor to the office of Sister Belinda Heaney, a woman in her mid forties with, with a serious, slightly dour expression. And it was there, it in the cramped little office, that I was told of how the woman, uh, the woman they knew as Diana Roberts, has come to them through a liaison organization working with the foreigners stranded in the communist China. All the Chinese authorities had known of her when handing over, when handing her over was that she had been living in in an institution for the mentally ill in Chongqing since the end of the war. It is possible she had spent most of the war there too, Sister Belinda said. It hardly bears thinking about Mr. Banks, what sort of place that was. A person once incarcerated in such a place could easily never be never be heard again. It was only because she was a white woman she was singled out. The Chinese didn't know what to do with her. After all, they want, they want all foreigners out of China. So eventually she was referred here and she has been with us now for nearly two decades. When she heard when she first came to us she was very agitated. But within a month or two the usual van- benefits of Rosedale Manor, the peace, the order and the prayers began to, to do their works. You wouldn't recognize her now as the poor creature who arrived here. She's so much calmer. Your relative, did you say? Yes, it's certainly possible, I said. And since I was in Hong Kong, I thought it was only right I paid a visit. It's the least that I could do. Well, any news of kin, close friends, any links with England, we have, we would be very glad to hear about. Meanwhile, a visitor is always welcome. Does she have many? She has many visitors regular. She has visitors regularly. We run a scheme with the pupils at, of Saint Joseph College. I see. And does she get on well with other residents? Oh yes. And she's no trouble to us at all. If only we could say the same about the others. Sister Belinda led me led me down another corridor to a large, sunny room. It had perhaps once been a dining room where twenty or so female dressed in beige smocks were sitting and shuffling about french doors were open to the ground shu- grounds outside and the sunlight was falling through the windows across the par- parquet for parquet 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 flooring 
Had it not been for the large number of the vases filled with fresh flowers, I might have mistaken the room for a children's nursery. There were bright watercolors pinned all over the wall at various points, little tables with draughts, playing cards, paper and crayons. Sister Belinda left me standing there by the entrance while she went over to another stop. To another nun, sorry, sitting at an upright piano, and a number of women stopped what they were doing to stare at me. Others appeared to become self-conscious and tried to hide themselves. Almost all were Westerners, though I could see one or two Eurasians. Then someone started to wail loudly somewhere in the building behind me. Curiously, this has had the effect of putting the women at their ease. One wiry-headed lady nearby grinned at me and said, don't you worry, love. It's only Martha. She's blooming well off again. I could hear the Yorkshire in her accent and was wondering what tides of fate had brought her to this place. When sister, when sister Belinda returned, Diana should be outside, she said. If you would follow me, Mr. Banks. We went out through the French doors into the well-tended grounds which climbed and dipped in all directions, reminding us we were near the crest of a hill. As I followed Sister Belinda past flower beds abloom with geraniums and tulips, I glimpsed panoramic views over the neatly cut hedges. Here and there, old ladies in beige smocks were sitting in the sunshi sunshine, knitting, chatting together or muttering harmlessly to themselves. At one point, Sister Belinda paused to look about her and led me down a sloping lawn through a white gate into the, into the white walled garden. The only figure to be seen here was the old elderly lady sitting in the sun on the far side of the thinning grass, playing cards at a wrought iron table. She was so absorbed in her game that she did not look up as we approached. Sister Belinda touched her shoulder and gently said, Diana, here's the gentleman come to visit you. He's from England. My mother smiled up at us both and then returned to her playing cards. Diana doesn't always understand what you say to her, Sister Belinda said. If you need her to do something, you just, need to, you just have to keep repeating it over and over. I wonder if I may speak to her alone. Sister Belinda was not keen on this idea and for a moment seemed to be trying to think of a reason why this was not possible. But in the end, she said, if you prefer it, Mr. Banks, I'm sure that's all right. I shall be in the day room. Once Sister Belinda had gone, I looked carefully at my mother and as she dealt out her cards. She was much smaller than I, had, than I had expected. Her shoulders had a severe hunch. Her hair was silver and had been tied bun tightly in a bun. Occasionally, as I continued to watch her, she, was, she would glance up and smile, and I could see the trace of fear that, that had not been there since in sister belinda's presence her face was not greatly lined but there were two thick folds be beneath her eyes that were so deep they looked almost like incision her neck perhaps owing to some injury or condition had receded deeply into her body so that when she gazed from the side to side at her cuts she was obliged she also moved her shoulders there was a droplet clinging to the tip of her nose and I had taken out with my handkerchief to remove it before realizing that, be by, that by doing so I might be unduly alarm her. Finally, I said quietly, I'm sorry I couldn't give you any sort of warning. I realized this might be something of a shock for you. I stopped since it was clear she was not listening. Then I said, Mother, it's me, Christopher. She looked up, smiled as before, then turned back to her cards. I had assumed she was playing solitaire, but as I watched, I saw she was following some odd system of her own. At some point, the breeze lifted a few cards off the table, but she appeared not to care. When I collected the cards from the grass and brought them back to her, she smiled, saying, Thank you so much, but there's no need to do that, you know? I, myself, I can... I'd like to leave it until many more cards have accumulated on the lawn. Only then I go gather, gather them all at one go, you see. After all, they can't fly away from the hill altogether, can they? 
For the next few moments, I continued to watch her. Then, my mother began to sing. She sang quietly to herself, almost under her breath as her, as her hands went on picking up and placing down the clouds. The voice was faint, but I could, not, I could not make out the song she was singing. But it was effortlessly melodious. As I went on watching and listening, a fragment of my memory came back to me of a windy summer day in our garden, my mother on the swing laughing and singing at the top of her voice and me jumping up and down before her telling her to stop. I reached forward and gently touched her hand. Instantly, she pulled away and stared at me furiously. Keep your hands to yourself, sir, she said in a shocked whisper. Keep them right to yourself. I'm sorry. I moved back to the a little to reassure her. She returned to her cards and when she gl next glanced up, she gave a smile as though nothing had happened. Mother, I said slowly, it's me. I've come from England. I'm really, really sorry. It's taken so long. I realize I have let you down very badly. Very, very badly. I tried my utmost, but you see, in the end, it proved beyond me. I realized this is hopelessly late. I must have started cr to cry because my mother looked up and stared at me. Then she said, Do you have a toothache, my man? If so, you better talk to Sister Agnes. No, I'm fine. But I wonder if you have understood what I'm saying. It's me, Christopher. She nodded and said, No use delaying it, my man. Sister Agnes will fill in your form. Then an idea came to me. Mother! I said, it's Puffin, 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 she suddenly became very still, Puffin, for a long time, my mother had said nothing, but the expression on her face had now changed entirely, she was looking up again, but her eyes were focused on something over my shoulder, and a gentle smile was creasing her face, Puffin, she repeated quietly to herself, and for a moment seemed lost in happiness. Then she shook her head and said, That boy, he's such a worry to me. Excuse me, I said. Excuse me. Supposingly, this boy of yours, this Puffin, supposing you discovered he has tried his best, tried with everything he had to find you, even if in the end he couldn't, if you knew that, do you suppose, do you suppose you will be able to forgive him? My mother continued to gaze past my shoulder, but now a puzzled look came into her face. Forgive Puffin? Did you say forgive Puffin? Whatever for? Then she beamed happily again. That boy! They say that he's doing so well, but you can never be sure with that one. Oh... He's such a worry to me. You have no idea. It might be foolish to you, I said to Jennifer when we were discussing the trip again last month. But it was only when she said that, it was only then I realized. What I mean is, I realized she had never ceased to love me, not through any of it. All she ever wanted was for me to have a good life. And all of the rest of it, all my trying to find her, trying to save the world from ruin, that wouldn't have made any difference either way. Her feelings for me, they were always just there. They didn't depend on anything. I suppose that might not seem very surprising, but it took me all the time to realize it. Do you really suppose? Jennifer asked. She has no inkling at all who you were. I'm sure she didn't. But she meant what she said, and she knew what she was saying. She said there was nothing for, nothing to forgive, and she's genuinely puzzled at the suggestion there might be. If you have seen her face when I first said that name, you would have no doubt about it either. She had never ceased to love me, not for a single moment. Uncle Christopher, why do you suppose you never told the nuns who you really were? I'm not sure. It seems odd, I know. But in the end, I just did, didn't. Because I saw no reason to take her away from there. She did seem somehow contented. Not happy exactly, but as though the pain has passed. She had never been 
she had, she had, she would have been no better off in a home in England. I suppose it was like this question of where she she should lie. After she died, I thought about having her reburied here. But then again, when I thought it over, I, I decided against it. She lived all her life in the east. I think she'd prefer to rest out there. It was a frosty October morning, and Jennifer and I were walking down a winding road in Gloucestershire. I had stayed the night at an inn not far from the lo- from the boarding house where she is currently living, and I had called on her shortly after breakfast. Perhaps I did not conceal well enough my sadness on seeing the shabbiness of her latest lodgings, for she quickly insisted, despite the chill, on showing me the view from the nearby churchyard over the Windrush Valley. As we came further down the lane, I could see the bottom of the gates of her farm, but before we reached them, she led me off the path through the gap in the hedge. Uncle Christopher, come and look! We pick, we pick our way through the thick patch of nettles until we were standing by some railings. I could, see, I could then see the fields sweeping down the valley side. It's a wonderful view, I said. From the church yet, can you see even you can see even further? Don't you ever think of moving out here too? London's too crowded now. It's not like it used to be. That's true. We stood there for a moment, side by side, gazing down at the view. I'm sorry, I said to her. I have not been up here much re- recently. I suppose it's been a good few months now. Can't think what I have been up to. Oh, you shouldn't worry about me. But I do. Of course, I worry. It's all behind me now, she said. All of that last year. I won't try anything foolish like that ever again. I've already promised you that. It was an especially bad time, that's all. Besides, I never really meant to do it. I made sure the window was left open. But you're still a young woman, Jenny. With so much ahead of you. It depresses me that you should even have contemplated such a thing. A young woman? 31? No children, no marriage. I suppose there is time, but I'll have to find a will, you know, to go through all of that again. I'm so tired now. I sometimes think, sometimes think I'll get, I'll gladly settle for a quiet life on my own. I could work in a shop somewhere, go to the cinema once a week, and, and not do anyone any harm. Nothing wrong with a life like that. But you won't settle for that. Doesn't sound like Jennifer to me. I know. She gave a small laugh. But you have no idea what it's like. A woman of my age, trying to find romance in a place like this. Landladies and lodgers whispering about you every time you step outside of your room. What am I supposed to do? Advertise? (laughs) Now, that would set them all talking. Not that I care at all about them. But you are a very attractive woman, Jenny. What I mean is, when people look at you, they can see your spirit, your kindness, and your gentleness. I'm sure something will happen for you. Do you think people see my spirits, Uncle Christopher? That's only because you look at me and still see the little girl you once knew. I turned and looked carefully at her. Oh, but it's still there, I said. I can still see it. It's still there, underneath, waiting. The world hasn't changed you as much as you think my dear it just gave you something of a shock that's all and by the way there are a few decent men in this world i'll have you know you just have to stop doing your utmost to avoid them all right uncle christopher i'll try to do better next time if there is a next time for a moment we went on gazing at the view a light wind blowing across our faces eventually i said i should have done more for you Jenny, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what could you have done? If I take it into my silly head to... No, I meant I meant earlier, when you were growing up. I should have been there with you more. But I was too busy trying to solve the world's problem. I should have done a lot more for you than I did. I'm sorry. There, always meant to say it. How can you apologize, Uncle Christopher? Where would I be now without you? I was an orphan with no one. You must not ever apologize. I owe you everything. I reached forward and touched the cobweb suspended across the railings. It broke and dangled from my finger. Oh, I hate that feeling, she exclaimed. Can't bear it. 
I've always rather really liked to do it. When I was a boy, I used to take off my glove just to do it. Oh, how could you? She laughed loudly, and I could see suddenly the old Jennifer. Uh, suddenly the Jennifer of old. And what about you, Uncle Christopher? How about you getting married? Don't you ever think about it? Definitely too late for that. Oh, I don't know. You manage well enough living on your own, but it doesn't suit you much either. Not really. It makes you a more. It makes you morose. You should think about it. You always have mentioning. You always mentioning your lady friends. Won't one of them? Won't one of them have you? They have me for lunch, but not more. For, but not for more. For much more, I fear. I added. There was once. So there was someone once back then. But when the way of everything else, I gave a quick laugh. My my great voca vocation got in the way quite a lot. All in all, I must have turned away from her. I felt her touch my shoulder, and I looked around. She was peering gently into my face. You shouldn't always talk so bitterly about your career, Uncle Christopher. I have always admired you for what you tried to do. You tried this right. It all amounted to very little in the end. Anyway, it's all behind me now. My major ambition in this life these days is, is to keep this rheumatism at bay. So Je Jennifer suddenly smiled and slipped her arm through mine. I know what we'll do, she said. I have a plan. I've decided I'll find a decent man whom I'll marry. And then I'll have three, no, four children. And we'll live somewhere near here where we can always come and look over this valley and you can leave your stuffy little flat in London and come live with us. Since your lady friends won't have you, you can accept the post of uncle to all of my future children. I smiled back at her. That sounds like a fine plan. Though, I don't know if your husband would be so would so appreciate having me around his house the whole time. Oh, then we'll rig up an old shed or something for you. Now? That does sound tempting. Keep your end at the bargain and I'll think about it. If that's a promise, then you better watch out because I will make sure it happens. Then you'll have to live in your shed. Over the last month, as, as I have drifted through these grey days in London, wandering around Kensington Gardens in the, in the company of autumn tourists and office workers out for their lunch breaks, occasionally running into an old acquaintance and perhaps going off with him for lunch or tea, I have often found myself thinking again of my conversation with Jennifer that morning. There's no denying it has cheered me. There is every reason to believe that she has now come through the dark tunnel of her life and emerged at the other. What awaits her there remains to be seen, but she is not by nature someone who easily accepts defeat. Indeed, it is more than possible she will go on to fulfill the program she outlined for me only half jokingly as we look out over the valley that morning. And if in a few years' time things have indeed gone according to her wishes, then it is not out of the question. I will take up take up her suggestion to go and live with her in the country. Of course, I would not much fancy her shed, but I could always take up a cottage not too far away. I am grateful for Jennifer. We understand each other's concern in instinctively, and it, and it is exchanges like that, one like that frosty morning which have proved such a source of consolation for me over the years but then again life in the countryside might prove to be too quiet and i have become rather attached to the london of late besides from time to time i am still approached by persons who remember my name from before the war and wish my advice on some matter only last week in fact when i went to the dinner with the osbournes i was introduced to a lady who immediately seized my hand ex exclaiming you mean you are the Christopher Banks, the detective? It turns out that she spent most of her life in Singapore and she had been a very good friend of Sarah's. She used to talk of you all the time, she told me. I really do feel I know you already. The Osbournes had invited several other people, but once we sat down to eat, I found myself placed beside this same lady. Inevitably, our conversation drifted back to Sarah. You were good friends of hers. Weren't you? 
<laughs> Won't you? She asked at one point. She always talk of you. She sh she always talks so admiringly of you. We were good friends, certainly. Of course, we were the lost touch when she went out to the east. She often talked about you. She had so many stories about the famous detective. Kept us quite amused when we uh, when we grew tired of playing bridge. She always spoke most highly of you. I'm. I am moved to think that she remembered me so well. As I say, we rather lost touch, though I did receive a letter from her once around two years after the war. I wasn't aware until then how she had spent the war. She made light of the internment, but I'm sure it was no joke. Oh, I'm sure it was no joke at all. My husband and I, we could so easily suffer the same fate. We managed to get ourselves to Australia just in time, but Sarah and Madame Deville... The Philford, she always trusted, trusted so much fate. They were sort of a couple who went out in the evening with no plans, quite happy to see who they bumped into. A charming attitude most of the time, but not when the Japanese on your doorstep. Did you know him also? I never... I never had the pleasure on meet, of meeting the Count. I understand he returned to Europe after Sarah's death, but our path has never crossed. Oh, I thought about I thought from the way she talked of you, you were good friends with them both. No, you see. I only know I only, I only knew Sarah from her earlier part of her life. I beg your pardon, there's perhaps no way for you to answer this, but did they strike you as a happy couple? Sarah and this French chap? A friend a happy couple? My companion thought for a moment. Of course. One can never know for sure, but quite honestly, it could be hard to believe otherwise. They did seem utterly devoted to one another. They never had much money, so that meant they, they could never be quite as carefree as they might wish for. But the Count always seemed so, well, so romantic. <laughs> you laugh, Mr. Banks, but that's just a word for it. He was so devoted, he was so devastated by her death. It was the internment that did it, you know. Like so many others, she never fully recovered her health. I do miss her. Such a charming companion. Since this encounter last week, I have brought out and read again several t times Sarah's letter. The only one I ever received since our parting in Shanghai all those years ago. It is dated 18th of May, 1947. And has been written on a hill station in Malaya. Oh my god. Perhaps... It was my hope that after my cons conversation with her friend, I would discover in those rather formal, almost bl blandly pleasant lines, some hitherto hidden dimension. But in fact, the letter continues to yield up a little more than the bare bones of her life since her departure from Shanghai. She talks of Macau, Hong Kong, Singapore as being delightful, colorful, fascinating. Her French companion is mentioned several times, but in passing, as though I already knew all there was to to know about him. There is this breezy mention of internment under the Japanese, she, and she pronounced her health problems a bit of a bore. She asks after me in a polite way and calls her own life in liberated Singapore a pretty decent thing to to be getting on with it is a sort of letter one might write in a foreign land on an impulse one afternoon to a vaguely remembered friend only once towards the end does does its tone imply the intimacy we once shared i don't mind telling you dearest christopher she writes that at that time i was disappointed to say the least at the way things transpired between us but don't worry I have long ceased to be cross with you. How could I remain cross when fate, in the end, chose to smile so kindly on me? Besides, it is now my belief that for you it was the correct decision not to come with me that day. You always felt you had a mission to complete, and I dare say you would never have been able to give your, bed, give your heart to anyone or anything until you had done so. I can only hope that by now your tasks are behind you and that you too have been able to find the sort of happiness and companionship that I have come lately almost to take for granted. There is something about this section of her letter and those last 
lines in particular that never quite ring true. Some subtle notes that runs throughout the letter, indeed, her very, her very act of writing to me at that moment, feels at odds with her reports of days filled with happiness and companionship. Was her life with the French Count really was what she set off to find that day she stepped out of the jetty in Shanghai? I somehow doubt it. My feeling is that she is thinking of herself as much as she of me when she talks about sense of mission and the futility of attempting to evade it. Perhaps there are those who are able to go on about their lives unfettered by such concerns. But for those like us, our fate is to face the world as orphans chasing through long years of shadows of vanished parents. There is nothing for it but to try and see through our mission to the end as best as we can, for until we do so, we will be permitted no calm. I do not wish to appear smug, but drifting through my days here in London, I believe I can indeed own up to a certain contentment. I enjoy my walks in the parks, I visit the galleries, and increasingly of late I have come to take a foolish pride in sifting through old newspaper reports of my cases in the reading room in the British Museum. This city, in other words, has come to be my home, and I should not mind if I had lived it I have to live out the rest of my days here. Nevertheless there there are those times when a sort of emptiness fill my hours, and I shall continue to give Jennifer's invitation serious thought. That is the end of when we were orphan. Yeah. Christopher definitely on copium. Oh, I wonder if she's really that happy with the French guy, you know, because uh, I'm supposed to be, to be a one that she she's super like and you know what to do and like you know. I I wish she was like a more jilted lover than she is like happy. I don't want her to be happy because she missed out on how awesome I am. Oh my god, fucking fucking bitch, man. Seriously, man. Guys. Don't ever be like that. If your ex girlfriend or your ex lover, I mean, not just guys, girls too. If your ex found someone that they love and uh, tell you that they are happy, don't go and say things like, well, I wonder if she's really that happy because the guy or the girl that she. Is she or he is date is dating right now or married to right now? Is not me, you know, because she used to love me so much, you know. <laughs> Fucking incels. But yeah, this is definitely not a great book. Like, I would say, like okay, but you see, right? It's good to have a main character that is not completely likable. Because if they are completely likable, then it's like too fake. Like, I I have I have problems with like um. What do you say? I have problems with. Uh, some okay. So I've been reading a few books, right? Like Lonely Castle in the Sky, Sweet Sweet Bean Paste, um books the cat that saved books that kind of thing i've read all those right i mean i i thoroughly enjoy it i think it it kind of like got better in like in the last few chapters uh but yeah it's a character it's just a character flaw that like it's just it's just a character flaw basically that i do not do not enjoy basically but otherwise uh it's uh it's pretty okay, I think. But it, 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 it... Okay, what I was trying to say is that... So, for the previous few books that I read from Japanese writers, they all have the same formula that they like in like... They like It's like a same formula Kool-Aid that they drink and they write the same thing, basically. It's always about the main character being like a likable but 
a flawed person in the sense that they are like introverted, they are shy, they are like bullied, they are in they are hikikomori, that kind of thing. And then after that, uh, they 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 chance upon something special or amazing that allowed them to like you know, uh, exert their power in the world and like the kind of like it's a very same like formula story that kind of thing. And I got so bored of that and I wanted to like just fall asleep whenever I was uh, reading it. I sincerely fall asleep when I was reading one of those books. Um, but I didn't fall asleep reading when we were orphans because there's like, just actually so many information and things to think about when you're reading through it. And Christopher Banks is not uh, the most likable character, but but he is a character nonetheless with like, you know, a, with... with um background with a um, legit background legit um like reasons why he is the way he is um because he was he used to be a single child he is very 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 um sheltered and then uh, people are often you know, ha- like when he was younger, people often do have to like do things his way, um, and he grew up very very privileged and rich uh, because of all the opium money that he didn't know it was opium money. Um, that makes him very entitled and very not exactly the like the most likable character when it comes to like he's like very emotion he's like emotionally stan like stan stunted yeah like he's still stuck in being a child like what that's why all the tantrums that he, he throw is like very childish you know if you can't do it then then why did you like you're so useless yeah man child basically that's right so but I'll give it to him that he didn't just run away with the girlfriend. I mean, not really girlfriend, but didn't just run away with the girl. Even though... Yeah, he's, he, he has a mission and he wanted to do it. That's, I give it to him that he, he didn't just run away from from everything to go with the girl to somewhere. Because I know for a fact that, like like Sarah said in the letter that he if he if he did run away with her at that time i think he would have lived his life very 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 um uh, resentful that he didn't get to finish up what he want what he wanted to do which is to find his parents right yeah so not the best character ever written but i accept it (laughs) uh it was okay it was okay um i'm glad i finished it such a fucking long book uh okay so remember i said that i'm gonna read natsume so saki next right but yesterday or the day before i was like um uh trying to like uh clean up my um like my library not library my bookshelf a little bit and i found some books that maybe it's very interesting so the next time the next time the next session that i'm reading on friday on wednesday i'm going to be reading um uh at one go on wednesday omoshiroi Definitely, omoshiroi. Definitely, definitely. I agree with you. Okay, so the next time when we are uh, on this coming Wednesday, I'm going to read a single book. Uh, it's it, uh, it's an essay. No, not really a book. It's an essay by Junichiro Ta- Ta- Tanizaki. Junichiro Tanizaki in praise of shadows. Uh, expect a. Uh, Expect a lot of pretentiousness from this book because it's all about light and darkness and all those kind of like, you know, stuff. 
um so um yeah i'm going to be reading uh in place of shadow by junichiro tanizaki on this coming friday and then after that instead of uh soseki i'm going to read uh a uh, murder mystery book called The Inugami Curse by Seishi Yokomizo. Seishi Yokomizo. The reason why I'm reading this is because it's my friend's book and I want to return it to her. <laughs> so, this is the last book that I, 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 I borrowed from her that I wanted to finish it up so I can return it to her. So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this first. Seishi Yokomizo, The Inugami Curse first. Uh, on this Friday, starting on this Friday, and after that, we are going back to the uh, rotation of Natsume Sonoseki books and Kazuo Ishiguro books, basically. So, uh, for those who are looking forward to it, thank you. I mean, um, I mean, I hope you guys are looking forward to it. But anyway, um. Thank you so much for being here today. I truly appreciate your attendance uh, in both uh, stream and also in game. Uh, I'm very hungry now. The reading went on far too long and I really want to do more work. So I'm going to see you guys on this coming Friday. I'm sorry, uh, Wednesday. Junichiro Taninzaki in, the, in Praise of Shadows. I will see you guys on this Wednesday. So until then, thank you so much for being here with me today. I appreciate it so very much. And I will send you off with my favorite song in the world. Have you ever had a dream that, 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 that you, you, you can do? And until then, have a great day. Have a great Monday. Have a great week ahead. I uh, hope you have a smooth as a butter week ahead. And all good jujus come to you. Bye bye. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. ASMR. Whispering. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you all. Stay. Goodbye.